Okay, we are now recording. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, did you invite the public too, Stephanie? Sorry. Yes, they're already. Yep. Enabled to come in. Great. Okay, great. Okay. Dan? Well, oh, here's Dan. Oh, great. Thanks, uh, Dan. Welcome. Yep. Good. All right. <clears throat> hi, Laura. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay. Well, welcome everybody uh, to the November 9th, 2023 meeting of this Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. What we hope and expect to be our final meeting uh, to finish up our work um, on drafting a bylaw for the town uh, for their consideration. So thank you everybody for the year and a half <laughs> of good work. Um, on this. And uh, and again, hats off to um, our staff, town staff, uh, Chris, Stephanie, on uh, working with us through this process. Um, we need a note taker for today, um, which I just had up on my screen in terms of uh, who is scheduled next to be up. And Dan, that would be you. If I was going to nominate Dan. <laughs> He looks like a woman. Yeah, yeah. here months. You got your turn yeah, to go to work. <laughs> okay, you're you're uh, way overdue. So uh, that'd be great. And yeah, you, uh, keep in mind this is a marathon meeting, three hours, so uh, it's payback. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. Um, okay, and um, we'll we'll consider taking a break and halfway through if people if people um, decide uh, we want to do that. Okay, um, with that. Um, Let's look at the agenda. Um, and obviously we wanna dedicate the vast bulk of today's meeting on the bylaw, uh, picking up where we left off in, I think October uh, 10th, I think it was, um, and uh, and getting through it um, uh, today. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, uh, Martha, you have a hand up, so. Uh... Yes, yes, so I wanted to just say, Mr. Chair, that since we have so much to do, your vice chair has a clock here, and I want to, you know, as we step through, we have so much to cover, I will, uh, if you don't mind, try to uh, interject occasionally to keep us on track or something. I appreciate that, um, and I think once we get into the language, I think, um, as we did before, we'll try to... Um, skip through areas that are that we generally and Chris I think can um, be comfortable that is not particularly contentious uh, um, uh, that we've all had a chance to look at at least uh, and then and, and be a little bit more efficient in terms of getting through and then focusing on the areas that need some discussion potentially Chris wants some input from us uh, and Martha yes if you can um, be a um, a, a conch, conscience for the group in terms of uh, how we're pacing ourselves, that would be super. Appreciate yeah. it. I, I recommend that we do not try to put it up on the screen and read through line by line. We've all had a week to um, read this and we can just go section by section and ask if people have comments would be my suggestion. Uh, except for a couple of, new, couple of new places, yeah. Yeah, I think it. I think it is worthwhile to do that in section, but with it up on the screen and yeah, through it. Um, uh, and I, I'll use Chris's judgment on that. Um, okay, but let's um, the agenda. Uh, let's um, work through the agenda to get to the the main body here um, uh, of the. Okay, so here we go. Um, so first order of business is to. Um, review and uh, preferably vote on the minutes. Um, thank you, Martha, for very good minutes from last meeting on the 10th of October. Uh, these were in the packet. I think Stephanie um, emailed them a little bit after the main packet, but should be in our packets now. And uh, hopefully people have had a chance to review. So any comments or thoughts um, or desired edits on the minutes of October 10th? Um, or a motion to accept them. I, I move to accept the minutes of October 10th as written. All right, thank you, Janet. Anybody want to second that motion? 
Jack, I think you have to actually say something. I'll second it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, and then um, uh, via voice vote, please make sure you are unmuted and that your camera is on when you vote. In no particular order, McGowan? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Corcoran? Stain. Jemsek? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and then, then we uh, sort of have the same process. I think we went through last time, thinking that last one might have been our last meeting, um, that we need to authorize a member um, to approve our minutes on behalf of the bylaw group, uh, given that we are not planning to meet again. Uh, so we would need to, somebody, to, a member, to authorize, accept our minutes from for today today's minutes. So do we have a motion on who that member would be and to move forward with that jack uh, i nominate Dwayne to approve the last set of minutes i'll second it all right thank you i can second that yep okay and uh so for uh, an official vote again in no particular order uh, mcgowan Oh, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Hanner? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. Super. Okay. Um, so uh, any staff updates before we get um, into the meat of the meeting? I do not have any staff updates. Super. I do not have any staff updates. All right. Stephanie, did you say you did have? Oh, you don't. Okay. Okay. Super. All right. Uh, how about committee updates uh, from um, us that are liaising for committees? I mean, the planning board talked about um, the next steps and, you know, what's the next step after we get the draft bylaw approved by our committee and planning board members are interested in seeing it, um, you know, and I think the understanding is it's going to go to town council and get sent back to the planning board and CRC. That was the gist of think of what we talked about, but I might be wrong. It wasn't yeah, a long discussion. Yeah, I would suggest, yeah, there is a, a uh, plan uh, for the, sort of the moving forward that Stephanie did include in the meeting packet. Um, I suggest we get to that when we talk about uh, next steps, number six on the agenda item uh, that lays that out pretty uh, precisely as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so maybe we can review that at the end. Um, and that was just, that yeah. was like the only conversation we had about the bylaw. So. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely the planning committee will be reviewing. All right. Super. Okay. So that brings us to the uh, primary topic of today, uh, which is um, to uh, <laughs> review the, the the remaining sections, which are uh, substantial uh, in the bylaw. Um, and I, I think to Martha's point and, and others, uh, let's try to do this as efficiently as possible. I, I would defer to um, uh, Stephanie sharing, but I think Chris is gonna take us through this um, as uh, to, to make sure that she gets from us what she needs, as well as we get uh, to, to uh, Chris uh, what we, um, our review, uh, either things that you have come up with yourself on your own review, um, or as we go through this and have have discussion on on some of these issues. Uh, so, Chris, you want to lead us through this, and we, um, yeah, I just need to know where to start, Chris. Sure. Uh, let me just say that um, from the beginning, I did um, receive comments from Steve Roof, who is not a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, but he, um, you know, has has a lot of knowledge about this topic. Um, I received comments, I think, from Janet McGowan. I think I received comments from Martha Hanner. And um, those comments have been incorporated into, oh, and also Scott Cashin. Uh, he submitted a lot of comments. Um, so I've incorporated those into the uh, 
into the um, main draft. Um, and we, if we have time, we may want to go back and look at those later. But for now, I think we should go to page 17, um, which is agrivoltaics. And we had left off um, with discussion of agrivoltaics. And I think we agreed that, um, well, I'll wait till Stephanie gets there. There we can go. Large, can it be enlarged? Yes. Super. Okay, I think we decided that um, we sh that it uh, <clears throat> if you have. Um, an agri a solar by a solar array on farmland on farmland that is prime or of statewide importance that it shall be developed as an agrivoltaics array i don't think you actually took a vote on this but i think there was consensus about this unless there is um information presented to the uh permit granting authority um such that it is not um financially or technically feasible to do this on that property and we had a discussion about that and I think we agreed we achieved consensus on that so if people agree that we achieved consensus we can move on to um, requirements regarding soil management um, which is down a little further down the page if Stephanie will scroll down right and I, that's my recollection is that we were good with that uh, mm -hmm. um, structure um, all right Okay. okay. Um, so requirements regarding soil management. Uh, I think we didn't have any comments on this part on page 17, but on page 18, um, Janet asked that we add on under B, um, utilize existing farm roads, field edges, light construction equipment to minimize soil compaction and disturbance and reduce road widths to 12 feet. And I think those were things that, um, that she plucked out of the KIPP um, comments, and I don't think there would be too much discussion about that unless you want to discuss it. Um, then down under D, Scott Cashin and Janet had comments. Uh, I guess Scott Cashin's were about D, temporarily halt use of heavy construction equipment following heavy rainstorms or a large storm event when soils are saturated and the site shall be inspected and necessary corrections made prior to resuming construction. I think that's reasonable. I think there's still some question about what constitutes a heavy rainstorm or a large storm event, but I've tried to define that in the definition section. <clears throat> yeah, I then, saw that. Um, and yeah. could, I would just maybe capitalize the terms uh, that are defined. A large storm event, okay. Yeah, yep. Um, okay, and then E, seed or oversee the entire site with cover crops, green manure crops prior to any construction. That was something Janet put in, maybe from Kip's comments. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that's to stabilize the site prior to construction. Um, number three, avoid the use of chemical soil stabilizers such as salts, magnesium chloride, <clears throat> Asphalt emulsion, vegetable oils, molasses, synthetic polymers, <laughs> mulches, and lignin products. I wasn't exactly sure how to interpret this. This was a comment from Scott Cashin. I thought that um, vegetable oils, molasses, and mulches would be acceptable as soil stabilizers, but he apparently doesn't think so. So maybe that's something that needs to be a question that I need to ask of him. Um, so we're say, saying don't use chemical soil stabilizers, but, and don't use these other things. But I think that's a question. Um, I think that's worth finding out. Um, right. Just also is going back to E is, is green manure crops. Is that anybody know what that is? It came from Janet. So maybe she knows what it is. Um, it's from Kip Kolansky. Kalanskis, whose name I can't pronounce. 
I know of cover crops, but I don't yeah, know, green manure. Well, crop. Yeah, I just put it in from his comments. I thought they were like, um, just the idea. Like, I'm assuming all the construction starts during warm weather, and then just to make sure you cover as much as you can, and then deal with the site. I'm gonna. So I just pulled that from him. Green manure is a crop specific. I'm I'm doing a. It is a thing. <laughs> Green manure crops are most often grown by commercial farmers looking to maximize profits from cash crops, um, provide green manure, have other benefits, add nutrients to the soil, prevent erosion, suppress weeds, and reduce soil compaction. Um, so I guess it's a different kind of cover crop or a cover crop. Um, Can I often that? use the legumes to fix soil. So I don't know, maybe these are two separate terms or maybe they overlap, so. All right, Laura. I'm not, I'm, I'm not married to it. <laughs> the green manure, okay. <laughs> right, do you have any insights on to, into that? I was gonna have Jack go first, sorry. I forgot okay, about sorry. Yeah. Okay, Jack, I didn't see that. Well, um, I, I'm not talking about the green manure part, but so I might as well just stay on green manure for here uh, for a minute. I was just gonna say, I really want to avoid introducing new concepts right now if we can, um, just because we don't have a lot of time. So I, I don't have enough. I didn't I didn't look and talk to industry and see if, how reasonable that is. I mean, it sounds great. I just, in general, I'm like hesitant to introduce new concepts. That's all. I mean, a compromise could be, you know, to add some clause here to the extent feasible or or um, along those lines. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right, Jack. Oh, uh, I'm just wondering about the soil stabilization. Uh, sort of, you know, what's left um, with regard to like excluding the mulch and that's yeah. why I thought it may not be, he may not have worded this exactly correct. It seemed to me that he wanted to exclude the chemical soil stabilizers, but the things like vegetable oils, molasses, mulches seem to be organic. Organic. And I'm not yeah. sure about lignin, but I think lignin is related to stones, isn't it? So I have a question mark to ask him about that. I, yeah. I don't have a uh, raising my hand feature available to me at the moment, or at least that I can find easily. So I'm going to just jump in, but also to say that I think that, um, you know, I think the town has its sort of standard language for these types of um, materials. And so, I mean, even if you put it in, I think this is going to go through additional department head review. And I would think conservation will be looking very carefully at these types of um, measures. I personally don't fully agree with this so um just as my you know with my wetlands previous wetlands hat on um certainly salts are often um you know kind of avoided but i think some of these other more natural um materials and organic materials i don't necessarily think without more research we would want to say we're just going to ban them so i think it might be a little overreach Okay. Um, and then number five, conduct a second rather than a repeat soil health analysis that seems reasonable. Um, when... I guess I was just going to say on, on that, following up to Stephanie, maybe we should just go on record as saying that we question that particular line of inserts there uh, until there is further uh, clarification of the, or something like that. So number three. Right? Yeah, number the one three. that we've just yeah. been discussing. Yeah, that we kind of left it hanging there, but maybe we really do want to, I think there's enough uh, concern from the committee that maybe we just do want to go on record as saying that we, we question that and feel it would need further um, research before being included or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Is that okay. okay? Okay, thank you. Just um, <laughs> yep. 
Under agrivoltaics design and reporting requirements, um, substitutions of other agricultural uses such as grazing um, is, and Janet wanted to say prohibited yes. rather than discouraged. That's the language we had in originally was prohibited. Okay. We've had All that right. in consistently. Okay. I'll, I'll push back on that a little bit and, and look for Laura for any of her experience. I guess I my concern would be a twofold. One is that the state has rules and regulations with regard to the SMART program and incentive that um, certainly discourages and makes it hard for um, this type of switching of agricultural um, practice uh, to sort of um, uh, to, to, to say easier and less productive or valuable crops um, or agricultural products. Uh, I guess my pushback would be that this adds substantial risks to solar development of agrivoltaics. Um, if, um, if the farm is not over its 20 years, um, able uh, that it gets the uh, incentive, uh, able to is prohibited from going into a certain direction um, and is unfeasible to stick with norm with the farming that they are doing. And that's an added risk, uh, financial risk uh, to the solar developers in terms of uh, whether they'd be worthwhile developing a project um, and getting financing for a project with that added risk that they are prohibited from, from taking this, uh, making this change. Laura. I was going to say, I agree with you. Um, listen, it's a long time we're talking about here. I think people, you know, we want to motivate people to do the best they can, but I, you know, I, I really don't, I think, you know, we want to encourage the right activities in Amherst, but I'm just also sensitive to language that, you know, I see a lot, which is just making it more difficult for solar to get installed, period. And, you know, a lot of things can happen over the term. I mean, uh, you know, most of the times these projects, it's not just the initial financing term, but, you know, the extensions of leases. I mean, these are long, these are long projects. So 35 years on average. All right. I, I um, think discouraged, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Janet and then Martha. So I kind of want to argue both ends of the argument, um, which of course is always my training. One of them is, as I'm looking at this language, I'm thinking there have to be season, like, you know, even if you're growing crops, it's you might have a year or two that you want to graze animals on it. And I know Brookfield does that with their pigs and their hens and their cows as a way of, you know, enhancing the productivity of the soil. And I wouldn't want to get in the way of that. On the other hand, I know that, you know, like I think it's in Grafton, um, you know, somebody has like 12 cows and that's, you know, dual use. And then, you know, there's out in um, the tank Lennox, the proposal was for 18 sheep on like 20 acres as, as, as farming. And so I don't know how it, you know, the state is regulating that in terms of like preventing, you know, just saying, okay, we'll throw some sheep on and now you're in dual use and you get your, you know, you know, big adders per acre. And so I feel kind of maybe discourage might be the best way, or I don't want to discourage people using animals as a way of enhancing productivity of soil, you know, it, you know, as a regenerative farming technique. So I'm not sure there's an answer you know, to say we want the best, you know, the best thing. So maybe discourage is a good compromise. Yeah. All right. Final word on this, Martha. Yeah, I mean, my concern is that it's so much easier for a nice big for a big developer to come in and persuade the farmer that, oh, you know, it'd be more profitable to you to just let me pay you for a nice big solar array than to grow your food crops. Um, and we have, you know, our local concerns about wanting to preserve our local uh, ability to grow foods. Uh, we have the state. Uh, making those statements of no net loss of, you know, forests and, and farmland, there ought to be a way uh, to uh, make a substitution. I mean, most farmers, you know, know their land 
And they can say, oh, yeah, you know, this part of the land really is not as productive. It's gotten too soggy or whatever, whatever. But I can, you know, instead uh, convert this other area uh, to, to the food crops. So my concern is that it's just too easy to switch to pasture uh, and make big development. We have no limits on the size of development and how much farmland can be just taken over. And uh, yet it's very important that we preserve our ability to grow food crops. And so I that's why um, I would like to say maybe we, I wonder if we could take out both the words discouraged and prohibited and just say, um, something more general that that if there's substitution of you know other uses such as grazing on prime farmland that is being used for food crops, and then just say that another equal area uh, should be uh, converted to growing food crops and not use as strong language as prohibited, but not use as weaselly language as discouraged. So that's that's my my concerns here is it makes it too easy uh, to just stop growing food crops. And uh, we had the other concern that since a lot of uh, parts of farms in Amherst are actually rented by the farmer, that suppose the owner comes along and says, gee, I could make more money if I just take this whole area and make it into solar panels. Um, what happens to the livelihoods of the farmers who were renting? So those are my concerns. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wish I knew them offhand, but there are guidances or, or regulations at DOER with regard to switching um, out crops um, for the dual use adder uh, that gives some protection. Uh, but I don't know the details of those um, offhand. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, we've had this language in here for a long time, it seemed. But Well, the discouraged language. Oh. Right? Okay, um, Laura, and then... I was going to say, can we just take a vote on this? Because I, I feel like we're, we have so much to review. Um, I actually <laughs> just wonder, because we're changing the language now from discouraged to prohibited, uh, unless you have another suggestion, I feel like we could take another 20 minutes talking about this concept. Yeah. Yep, let's um, let's take one more comment from Martha, from Janet, and then I think we're done. I think we could re rework this a little bit, saying um, if um, prime farmland currently being used for food crops is sub, you know, converted to grazing, other agricultural uh, to grazing, then an equal or larger acreage of prime farmland, you know. So, you know, just just say, I mean, it's not pretty, but just basically say, if it's being used for vegetables and it's being converted to grazing, then you do the equal or larger acreage of prime farmland. And I think that's doable in Amherst because there is, you know, a fair amount of mm -hmm. farmland that is either fallow or being used as hay, and that could be easily converted to vegetables. So I think kind of like if you do this, then you have to find, you know, bring something back in. Yeah, so if we just change the word, as, as I say, change the wording, eliminate both the, uh, yeah. the words prohibited and discouraged, and just, Janet, if maybe you could read it again, maybe we could vote. I'm trying, on I'm, this is like, so like if, if prime farmland currently being used for food crops is converted to grazing, then an equal or larger acre of prime, prime farmland, you know, will be, you know, or land not being currently used for farming will be converted to growth of food crops. Yeah. That's not pretty, but I think that's the gist. And I, I would give, yeah. let Chris make it more clear. Yeah. So it's sort mm -hmm. of like getting rid of, you know, it's just saying like, if you're doing that, then, you know, we still want vegetables to be grown as the highest use of the land. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that would be a, a big burden. Mm -hmm. I guess my concern is, you know, what uh, trying to predict the future of what it looks like 20 years from now. Um, uh, but, but then also I would, uh, to the extent that it was mentioned that there may be decent farming practice to convert a, 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 a food crop uh, acreage into 
hay or or some other cover crop or grazing uh, for a year or two and then convert it back. I would want to have sort of maybe if it's if it's converted for for you know two or more years or something along those yeah. lines. Yeah, yeah, that that that's would good. be okay. That's, that's okay. Yeah. And then okay. you know that's that's the trend is that there's more and more land in Amherst being used for vegetables. So it's not you know. We're seeing okay, that. Last word from Laura, and then if if she's re reasonably on board, we can go forward. If not, we'll we can take a vote for sure. So, yeah, I was going to make a motion. What is the um? What's the proposed language now? What are we doing, <laughs> Chris? Yeah, Janet, I I don't have it. I would have to go back and listen to the um. All right, and, and listen to I the would... audio. So you you said it, and maybe you can um. I'll try I'll it again. That. Um, if prime farmland currently being used for food crops is converted into grazing for more than a year or two, then an equal or larger acre acreage of prime farmland or land not being currently used for farming will be converted to the growth of food crops. No. It's, it's not I'm, pretty, but uh, I'm, I think um, I'm not in favor of that. Just so, I mean, I, I think I'm not in favor of that guys. I just feel like it's so hard to develop solar anyways. I want agrivoltaics. We're talking dec like more than decades in the future right now. Um, so my my motion would be to, you know, rather than today, I thought the goal was to review the document, which is what I prepared to do, not create new language. So my motion would be to keep discouraged and to move on. Okay. Uh, well, no offense, to... anyone. So, Martha, yeah. Janet, love you guys, but just that's, that's my motion. All right, Jack. Let's hear from Jack. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I just. I thought with regard to this trade off, um, that that was you know something we're considering for for forest land, but but I'm not really. Uh, I think this is overreaching dealing with this these types of provisions for the agricultural uh, development. So I. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not uh, for the change. Dwayne, sorry to jump in, but procedurally, you have a motion. Yeah. So it either needs a second or not. If it doesn't get a second, it just. What was the motion? <laughs> to, the keep motion the was to keep the to keep the to keep the original language of discouraged and not revise yeah, I, the revisions section. So I second the motion to keep the original language of discouraged. And we can cite the section. Um, well, so we can cite the section in the in the minutes. Yeah, in the in the. And I can help. I can help with that, Dan. So, um, all right. So I'm going to have to stop sharing because. Yeah. I need you all on screen for a vote. <laughs> so an affirmative vote is to keep the original language of of discouraged. Correct. Right. Sorry, I'll get myself on here too. All right. So, um, if you can make sure that your cameras are on and you are unmuted. Um, in no particular order, McGowan. Yes. Hanner. No. Gregor. Yes. Jemsek. Yes. Pagliarulo. Yeah. And Corcoran. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we keep the word discouraged as written. All right, now I will get back to sharing. All right, good. Um, or is that a new hand, Janet? Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm. So I'm feeling ambivalent because I'm not sure what it means to say it's discouraged. Like, what does it tell the committee to do? But also, Jack, I think you voted against the mitigation in for forest lands, and so have you changed that view? Um, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't recall what they, I can't really recall what the, uh, all the assumptions or, or basis for that, you know, my prior decisions, but. Well, I guess my, maybe the point here is, um, we just voted to keep this original language which says discourage but there's still the phrase that follows uh which is uh so it's now is discouraged unless an equal or larger acreage of prime farmland 
dot dot dot. So it does sound like we're require we're 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 discouraging it. But if 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 they go ahead and and change the land use to grazing, then they do need to put uh, set aside this other land. Is that how you read that, um, well, Chris? I think that the phrase after the word prohibited is um, a, vest a vestige yeah. of when we put in the word prohibited. And I probably should have highlighted that whole thing, starting with the word prohibited and ending with the word crops as being something for you to discuss and decide on. So oh. in my opinion, it sounds like you're deciding not to have that final phrase unless an equal or larger acreage. If you go with the word discourage, then everything after the word prohibited is dropped off. No, that's not what we voted on. That's voted not what on. you voted on. It's not, that's but I not, think that's what we have to consider I now. I think that's what yeah. you need to consider. Yeah, because I, I don't know if it makes sense right. otherwise. Uh, we're di discouraging behavior, but requiring something if they well, um, if they do it anyhow. No, uh, I'm lost. Yeah, we're not requiring it. We're just saying it's discouraged and unless you go put some other farmland into use somewhere else. I mean, that's... Oh, then that's, it wouldn't be discouraged? They, they be, that can be, dis that can be dis discouraged. That's still just, you know, not a requirement, but, a, you know, what you might call guidance from our committee or something to say it's discouraged unless there's an equal amount put in somewhere else. That sounds reasonable. I think that sounds reasonable, but I don't know if that's clear in this language. Uh, I think maybe maybe the comma doesn't belong there or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> How would a lawyer <laughs> read that? <laughs> I suggest perhaps you leave the language as is, which is what was voted on, and okay. move on and maybe flag this in some way. Okay. Yes. I, 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 if, need to on. if it's in, if it's interpreted the way I think Martha just said in terms of it's discouraged, uh, but it wouldn't be discouraged if they put land yeah. uh, mitigate. Um, I think that's I mean at least for me that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. let's move um, on then. If, moving on to number four. LPG developer, applicant, or landowner shall submit to the PGA an annual report on the agricultural performance and crop year yields, such as that required for a qualified ASTGU, this, that's the state program, mm -hmm. for the first five years, consistent with the plan submitted to the PGA prior to approval as described above. So in other words, um, you have to submit every year, you have to submit a report similar to what would be required for um, that state program for the first five years. That seems reasonable. That was a suggestion. I, I forgot to note who sent that, but I think it was Scott McGee, Scott Cashin. All right, I would maybe just add, uh, such as that required by the state or by DOER for a qualified ASTG. By the state, by the state. D O D O E R. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and then number five, a yearly report on erosion, bare earth, weeds, and woody and invasive plants monitoring shall also be submitted to the PGA. And I think that was something Janet suggested. Okay. We should maybe we should say a yearly report for how long? Should that be for the first five years? Or is that ad infinitum? Um, can I? Yeah, please, uh, Janet. So I, I can't remember if I read this on the Kip Kolinskis or the Scott Cashin stuff, but it seemed to me that like invasives were just a really serious problem. Um, and it could, you know, as we look at the woods happen anytime. So I would say a yearly report just because, you know, the, I mean, the, the people who run this are gonna be out there all the time. And if they have a farming operation, you know, they should be, you know, it kind of makes them make sure they're having, you know, they're containing it. Um, I do wonder if the ASTGU, if that's a word, um, is 
just do they just require reporting on the farming for five years or is it constant reporting it's constant for the duration oh. of the of yeah. the incentive at least yeah which yeah is it just seems to me that you know you want to make sure people just stay on the mark you know and so i don't i'm not sure that um we need number five it just seemed like that was a serious problem of invasives so I'm not i'm not going to die on the sword of it but So are you questioning in number four whether this should just be for the first five years? Well, it sounds like it will be covered anyway. So I'm not sure, you know, you know, the question is, does the town want to keep seeing that or not? I don't know. I was just curious about what the state requires. So what are we saying about this language in number four and five? Are we saying leave it alone with the way it is? Um, I'm, I'm fine with it. And I've also understood from talking to other people that like, it's really hard to establish the first five years is really a struggle to establish, you know, vegetation or even, you know, so that would be the part you may care about the most. So I'm, I'm fine with this language. So five years for both of them, Mar uh, Janet, are, is what you're suggesting? Or just leave it as it is. I mean, okay. I think the invasives can come anytime. Yeah, and as Stephanie said, others will be looking at this afterwards, and they will, yep, you know, okay. be picking this apart. So, okay, maximum, maximum, excuse me, sorry, maximization. Sorry, Chris. Dan has sorry. Yep, up. sorry. Yep, Dan. Yeah, a yearly report ad infinitum um, seems a little bit burdensome to me. Um, I know with like, for example, hazardous waste sites. Um, after you know the our remedial action has been completed, they have what they call five year reviews. Um, so that you know when we're when we're talking about you only need to you know do an inspection of the site every five years for a hazardous waste, and now we're talking about something much less harmful, invasive species. Perhaps the same kind of reporting requirement would be appropriate here. Um, five year reviews. Um, now, as Jana said, the most critical period is that first five years. So perhaps we could say a yearly report for the first five years and then a five-year review after that. Can we change the word yearly to annual? It's just a picky thing on my side. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I like Dan's approach. So we're saying an annual report for the first five years and a report every five years after that. Thereafter. Mm -hmm. Jack. Yeah. Yeah, I commend Dan for uh, referencing the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Contingency Plan well-written document. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're all agreed with that? All right, good. Let's move on. Okay, maximization of ecosystem services. Um, applicants or project owners for LGPIs that involve the use of five acres of land or more that was previously undeveloped shall prepare an ecosystem services plan. The ecosystem services plan <clears throat> shall demonstrate to the satisfaction of the PGA that the site plan for the entire footprint of the project would maximize ecosystem services of the land and the land nearby to the extent reasonably feasible without significant harm to the performance or safety of the solar project. Mm -hmm. my, my own opinion is that that all makes sense except for and the land nearby, because that implies that someone's going to go on to the land nearby, which doesn't belong to the project mm -hmm. owner or applicant. It belongs to somebody else. And I think that's going to, that's a problem. Yeah, that would be a problem. Um, yeah, uh, Martha. Yeah, just a quick editorial comment. This this section called maximization of ecosystem services really isn't far, part of the farmland thing. This is a new section. Yeah. And so it ought to be in caps and made clear that it's not under the, the farmland, I should think. I think you're right. Yeah. Okay, so a new se section, capital, not under farmland. Yes, yeah. and you sent me a message about that. To cons conservation in the next paragraph, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. 
Okay. Good point. Yeah. All, All right. right. Laura, uh, sorry. Uh, Kristen, we'll get going. Um, I guess my, so we talked about this, right? We talked about the ecosystem services plan in the previous meeting. Just help yeah. dust off my memory. Is that right? Yeah. And we define it somewhere in this document or is it just defined right yeah. here? Yeah, I think it's in the definitions. Ecosystem okay. services in the definitions. Yes. Yeah, I think it's fine. I just, mm -hmm. I think it's a, I don't think they have any control over nearby land. Um, yeah, I, think it's I really agree. Yeah. That's the great. parcel that we're talking yeah. about. And in fact, um, yeah, if there's, if there is excess acreage outside of that fenced in area, um, things like pollinators are so easy to create on any, I mean, really on any single solar array anywhere. Um, so, and I think that's a massive service, so. Okay, shall we is move it, on? Yeah, is it just abundantly clear that this would not apply to a dual use project? <laughs> I think it applies to everything, doesn't? Oh, doesn't it apply to everything? Yeah, does it? I'm not sure if food productions under ecosystem services. Oh, oh I see. Yeah, and with, that couldn't be. It couldn't be under dual use. No. Yeah. So maybe well, just like land that was previously undeveloped. So uh, maybe that gets us out. Oh, that was previously place. undeveloped. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that would that would be uh, an out. Yeah, certainly farmlands developed. Okay. Okay. The ecosystem services plan may include, and then it lists a bunch of things: um, maintain habitat, minimize bird deaths because you can't really prevent them, and provide nesting habitat in or near the array. Um, and allow passage of larger animals if a ray blocks a wildlife corridor. Those all seem reasonable to me. Do we have an existing, like, I guess my question is, if I was a developer and I happened to find a piece of land that would be suitable for solar and Amherst, which is hard enough, is there an existing ecosystem services plan for another kind of development that they could say, oh, here's the template? Or is it like they're just kind of creating it from scratch? I don't think that there is a requirement for an ecosystem services plan unless the Conservation Commission has that. Certainly the planning board does not have that. I don't know if I've ever reviewed one on the conservation. Um, certainly nothing that's been defined as that. I mean, certainly we asked for things like, hey, demonstrate, you know, X, Y, and Z, but Anyways, just a thought. We don't need to talk about it now. Let's move there, on. There is a um, some detailed criteria for certified pollinator friendly PV. Uh, that's not from the town, but from from uh, our group uh, that state that has been state approved. Uh, so that's at least one thing. That if they do want to do it at, in terms of pollinator friendly, uh, and it gets into wildlife friendly as well. Um, that's at least a document that, that can be referenced. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, where are we? Mm -hmm. um, wildlife corridor. The plan shall be vegetated with native species. So the land shall be vegetated rather than the plan. Land shall be vegetated with native species to avoid Avoid the planting or growth of invasive species, minimize the use of any herbicides or pesticides, and limit the mowing and time of such mowing to accommodate ecosystem health, for example, nesting birds, unless otherwise approved by the PGA. In addition, the plan should address impacts to landscape level movement of large animals. Mammals, excuse me. Okay, uh, applicant or project owner shall work throughout the project life to assure ecosystem services plan is implemented and shall report annually to the PGA on the status and actions taken to implement the plan and the remedial actions needed to rectify failures to meet the system, ecosystem services objectives. Such remedial actions shall be reviewed and approved by the PGA and shall be implemented by the applicant 
a project owner. Any any objections to that? All right. Okay. Sweet. The next part of this was added by Scott Cashin. Um, it seems to me a little overreaching, but we can read through it. Um, conservation measures. The project applicant or developer shall implement the na nationwide standard conservation me measures issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. No project activities that could impact nesting birds shall be conducted until the project applicant or developer has demonstrated to the satisfaction of the PGA that those activities would not violate the Migratory Bird Treaty Act or the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Um, any dead or injured wildlife detected by the LGPI site at the LGPI site during construction operation or decommissioning of the project shall be documented in writing and with photographs and reported to the PGA within 72 hours of discovery. If the PGA determines that the LGPI is causing excessive wildlife fatalities or injuries, <clears throat> the applicant or project owner shall implement remedial actions and designed to reduce those fatalities. The efficacy of the remedial actions shall be documented in annual reports to the PGA. Erosion and... Um, could, I, could I just ask in the interest of time whether we might just scroll through and just ask if anybody has specific comments on any of these parts instead of reading it all? Uh, the time is just clicking away. That's That's the only reason for saying that. My, my general thought is that it is a bit specific and overreaching and not a lot of this um, might be applicable to other parts of the country more so. Um, uh, so I'm not drawn to the need for these additional um, criteria, but let me, uh, Jack. Yeah, I'm in agreement, Dwayne. I'd just rather strike this and, and have this accompany the, the draft bylaw as separate comments, uh, you know, to the other uh, review bodies that come after us. All right, uh, Laura. Yep, I'm in agreement. Janet. Um, I, I completely agree. And, I, you know, I read through these and I started researching some stuff and, you know, what these acts meant. And I just thought this is so late in the process that. I wish we had seen this earlier and it just seems not appropriate to consider, but I do think there's some really valuable things that would be helpful to the zoning board of appeals or the people like, you know, trapping animals and stuff, but maybe on a bigger project, not a small one. And so I, I agree. I think we should, you know, just say great ideas and the next step, those could be submitted or could be part of an appendix of like, here's our two consultants that, you know, came and, offered their views and they seem worthy. I just think it's, I mean, I, I don't want to keep reopening and adding new things that we haven't really looked at. So, but I do appreciate the detail and, you know, I just think it, and it, it is probably too detailed for the bylaw anyway. So. Yeah. Maybe. I think it might go more into sort of things that the planning commission or the conservation commission or the PGA would consider when mm -hmm. they're looking at the plans of the developers and sort of maybe go back and say, Oh, you didn't, you know, we'd like you to cover the pipes, for example, or or, or, or just that that's this could be edited down to a more readable version for somebody. But I don't think this is our time and our last meeting to to start reopening and adding stuff that we have we don't know so much about. So okay, is there a consensus on on that approach, basically? And and I agree. It, it great to have this language in front of us and to get it to the town as sort of comments. Okay, then All let's right. super. Move on. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, this is page 21, dimensional standards. We've um, been through this, so do we really need to read it? I don't need to read it. Um, Wayne, what I do think, you think? I think we've talked about these setbacks yeah. okay. quite a bit earlier. Um, All right. Uh, so I think we're good. Okay. Um, Maybe just scroll through slowly. Energy storage systems. Yeah, okay. This, now, yeah. we do have a battery energy storage bylaw that we've developed, um, <clears throat> but Martha felt that it was necessary to include um, these points. I think there are maybe 12 of them in the main body of the solar bylaw so that people were aware of them 
in case the battery storage bylaw didn't get adopted at the same time. So do you want to read through these or just scroll through them and people can comment on them? So my own, I guess my own feeling is I hope that the battery storage bylaw gets adopted at the same time as the main solar bylaw. And, and in my mind, that would um, this not, uh, so then we wouldn't need these things in here, but I understand um, Martha's point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, um, yeah, let me hear what, um, well, Martha, you introduced these, so let's hear your. So, I mean, I feel that because the solar, because the battery storage bylaw is something very separate that we have never discussed, and I'm not sure our committee can really approve today, but that's a separate issue. I feel that because the batteries are a very important part of these large solar arrays, and there have been such problems, that we need these very brief requirements in here. They all come from the National Fire Association's um, rules and regulations. And so it's pretty straightforward here that, uh, you know, no long ramifications. They're either, these statements are either straight from the where bylaw that Chris has referenced or from the National Fire Protection Associations. And so they're just, you know, mostly just one-liners. The most key things are saying that we need to, that the, uh, the requirements of the Massachusetts laws plus the National Fire Protection Association 855 need to be followed. And that our fire department needs to review and approve of the battery storage plans, the hazard mitigation, et cetera, before the ZBA or permit granting authority approves. And those are really the key things. There's nothing, you know, new or unusual in here, as far as I can tell. Um, but I think it's necessary to include this section in, in a solar bylaw. So that's my comments. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Laura. Um, first of all, Martha, thanks for drafting this. I think that's the first thing. Um, I would, um, I, my sense of this is, so battery storage is obviously, whether it's standalone, we're talking about now those, those that are only coupled with solar or just broad, like across is, the board. This is only for the solar. Okay. All right. I would say, I think what you said, so my understanding of this space and we're starting to do a lot of this kind of work right now um is that it's just evolving so quickly yes and that i would i would actually um and this has got to be a living document mm -hmm. so i would actually just keep it to the you know the two authorities that you mentioned and there might be others honestly but that you're meeting all standards uh, mm -hmm. that if, if it's N nfpa um, and then, you know, obviously the fire department has to sign off. I mean, that's, that's going to be a permitting matter. Like I think yeah. no matter what we say, um, I think, um, the only, the only, uh, like, I just want to keep it high level just because this is going to mm -hmm. be opened again. Like I feel mm -hmm. like very soon, um, the, the, uh, number four, I'm not sure, Dwayne, you might know this, but I I just know, like, for example, um, you know, battery storage is, as well as transmission, a massive part of our renewable energy revolution. And if there's the ability to put in more capacity, I mean, these are small units. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to cap it. I don't know. I'm not an expert in battery storage. So um, that came from the where bylaw that Chris had referenced yeah, as being and, up on. Yeah. No, and I, I'm just saying, like, I don't know. Like, no, that could I, be, I, I mean, if there's a no. big environmental benefit for adding, like, another 500 kW, who are we to say no? I mean, um, is, yeah. Is that something that would be part of, of, of the other more general battery storage bylaw? Um, I feel like, um, like, things like annual training might be overkill. I, you know, it's like the, the, you know, they need to cut. I mean, I, I just don't want to be so prescriptive. But um, 
like water supply. You know, I just think I my, my view is just keep at high level. It needs to adhere to these standards um, only because I don't think anyone here is an expert on, yeah. um, well, you want to make uh, sure it's safe. I, I don't know. That's just my thought. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate you drafting this. That's what I want to say. I just, you know. Yeah, I mean, I tried to keep it general. The thing about the annual training came from the reports of those fires in New York State that have yeah. happened recently, yeah. and a couple yeah. of cases where the town said, oh, our fire department never knew about this or something. Yeah, but no, I mean, it's, thought, a good, it's Maybe a good it's point. so obvious it doesn't need to be said. I don't know. Yeah, you know? I mean, I think you're going to get to a point with battery storage, and I'm already seeing this, where, like, basically yeah. you have like signs that say do not like touch in the event of fire i mean it's going to be like so in your face yeah um but yeah. um but uh, you know you know so anyways water supply things like that i'm not sure um, yeah yeah I, I, I don't know that's all so i, I don't feel yeah. I, I don't know if i feel i hear you Chris, that you want to include something but aside from like high level stuff yeah. I, I love having these recommendations. Originally, I'd I'd written a, a paragraph which isn't necessary to include, but it said something about that the, the bat research on battery storage is evolving, and hopefully mm -hmm. by the end of a decade we'll have you know new kind, yeah. much more I mean, stable. Like, uh, but for the moment, because we have the lithium iron mm -hmm. batteries primarily, that, that that we need these requirements. So yeah. I don't know. And also, I'll, I'll say this like. I was just yeah. in New York City for the past two days, and they they approved, I mean, big battery storage facilities right in downtown Manhattan, all over the place. So, I mean, they're getting done everywhere, and, and there's a massive need there because that's where you need to store energy, not just solar. Um, these are standalone systems, but anyways. Yeah. I just, when I worked at JPL, which was the 1980s and 1990s, they had a huge battery storage system because they had to be in communication with their spacecraft, even if the power went down. And so I, I keep wondering, oh my goodness, how did they do manage that back then? <laughs> and then I think, um, my, I'm sorry, I'll shut up now, but um, okay. sorry. never mind. I just, I, I don't know if I feel, except for high level, I, I'm not, I, I don't know, water supply needs, this implies that water is important for thermal runway. I know it's from, from where, but is where the expert on battery storage? No, I mean, I'd rather look at like New York City and say, what the hell are they doing to get yeah. comfortable with battery storage, like in the most urban areas? So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, good. Yeah, I, th I would agree. Let's keep this just the bare necessities uh, and and it may be also some language about that. I presume it's this the battery bylaw that would sort of be the more um, um, bylaw that would be updated on a more regular basis as technology and issues change. So maybe some language here that says that um, these any rules here are um, are um, are preceded by um, any changes in the by in the battery bylaw. Um, Did you mean superseded? Superseded is that is that the proper superseded? Yeah, superseded. More than preceded. Superseded. Wait, could you say that again? I think I missed your point somehow. Well, I think uh, just to the extent that we don't want to have two. The town doesn't want to have two potentially inconsistent bylaws um, on this topic about batteries. So if it's going to be the battery bylaw that covers sort of siting and zoning around batteries then there should be some language here uh, that says that any um, by law stated here is superseded by the um, by the battery bylaw. Mm, I don't know. I, I think numbers one and two uh, and are certainly important no matter what the, the battery storage bylaw says. That, well, wouldn't they say this? <laughs> wouldn't they say these same things? Uh, we Certainly don't know. Number one. We don't know. I mean, we well, have if they to don't, then they don't for a good reason, know. presumably. Yeah. yeah. So we could I take the route of just leaving this in and having Chris Bascom review it. Um, let me just from hear from part. Jack. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to... The... Um, Water Supply Protection Committee spoke to about batteries quite a bit 
Um, and the water supply, I mean, it, it, it's not going to be there to put out flames. It's more for smoke control is my understanding. And that, you know, uh, I mean, I guess it's all good. Um, and it is awful late, but, um, yeah, but I guess one, that water supply, the, the, the fire, fire department has some tank trucks, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. So that one can be struck. Do you think? Yeah. Well, how yeah I'm just, I'm not, yeah, number, I'm just number six. Yeah. That came, I think, from the National Fire Protection Association description of, oh, well, you needed to cool the thing with water, even though you would not put out an electrical fire. Yeah. Cool the outside. So and, but that could just, come out. Yeah. Yeah. As long as the Amherst Fire Department are the ones that have to review the plans, then if they feel water was important, they could they could say that. Yeah. Um, and and, and the, the where uh, battery bylaw, is that, was that supported by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, do you recall, Chris? Yes, it was written okay. in tandem with um, the Planning Department and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission yeah. in where, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So six <laughs> could come out then. Um, I guess seven. I do. Yeah, I do have an issue, as was sort of mentioned, or at least with, uh, sorry, it's scrolling. Which one is it? Um four uh yeah um uh, I mean, how about saying unless unless granted by the pga or yeah i, th I think there okay. you know that um there are guidelines of what size batteries you should have with the pv array based on doer yes. but as as stated there may be very good reason to put more batteries there if it's a good site for batteries um, and uh, and there's good good need for additional storage. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to prohibit that. Um, yeah, and, and the way it's written, it's not really clear what capacity that is anyhow. Um, uh, shall not exceed the capacity necessary to store the energy generated by the on-site <clears throat> array over what period of time you would need to have sort of um, uh, presumably daily, but... Um, not not clear so i i would i would not so so it's going to add unless uh something by the approved unless, by the, unless approved by the yeah yeah. Uh, yeah that sounds good all right um all right so we'll strike a few of these things uh and then sort of clean them up i guess but janet yeah. um so I appreciate that Martha is doing this, and I also appreciate how hard it is to go line by line. We haven't discussed batteries, and and I just this looks like a good list to me of things based on you know the little gleaming things. I haven't done any research myself, and so I don't you know this seems like a good list, and I I would support it. Um, but I just don't really I we haven't really covered this in a year and a half, and so I'm just sort of struggling. Um, I had. Two, two questions for Laura, um, but I do want to, you know, I always think like at the beginning of the by the section, it should be a, a legal standard. And so I thought we should add in the first paragraph, all battery systems must safely contain fires and thermal runaway and prevent the release of toxic fumes. So that's, you know, I mean, I think that's up front that, you know, that has to be the what the industry is going for. And it also alerts everybody to what the risks are. And I know this battery stuff is, you know, the brave new world. My husband was just at the international, you know, electric truck thing. And all people did was talk about battery safety. And we're not there yet. And, you know, because there's fires in all different ways. And, you know, we're not sure that all the manufacturers are meeting standards or even know how their, how their equipment operates over time. So I think having a standard of saying everything has to you know, contain fire, thermal runaway, and toxic fumes is telling, you know, this is what the system has to do. And I think Martha's, you know, things are giving what we know and we, we've we heard about, but I don't, you know, I, I, when we go into the um, separate best system, I don't think I have really any knowledge or background or enough to basically say, oh, this is a good bylaw versus the one that Concord did or somebody else. So 
Um, anyway, so I'd like to add that in. Um, and then I have a few questions for Laura. So, I mean, I, I was wondering, um, do these standards include on-site generators? You know, that because if you lose power, you can't keep your batteries warm and you can't keep them cold. And, you know, and then I wondered about placement. Is there, you know, the idea of placing it next to trees sounds terrible to me. Maybe it's better to put the system further in the array. And so I just, I, I, I could probably ask like 20 questions because we really haven't discussed this. Yeah. Go ahead, Laura, if you had a response. I was to any say, of um, so I think in general, I agree with Jenna and that we haven't really talked about battery storage at all. And it seems like aside from like just the blanket language, it's hard to say, oh, here are the setbacks required and so forth. I do know that there seems to be, not unlike there was with solar years ago, a lot of fear around battery storage. And, you know, I think that while there definitely have been fires, like I'm not a, there are so many of these systems that have been operating for years in California, downtown Phoenix, New York City, Long Island, um, because I can't, I can't, I can't say enough. Like, um, they're like, we we need a capacity to st like to store output for renewables. Otherwise, we're not going to have more renewables because the grid, or we're going to build all new transmission, which is, in my opinion, also. I mean, that's a requirement to cut down trees. Um, so, you know, I, I just see this as things like you know. Like, you know, lithium ion batteries, I have it in my electric car. I have it in my cell phone right next to me right now. Um, I just think, I don't personally think we're in a place to, you know, I, I agree with what Janet said, um, which was they need to meet, you know, all fire requirements. And I think, and, and then you had something, said something about thermal runoff, but like that's kind of beyond us. I mean, that's like permitting and, you know, I'm not tracking like the best practices nationally. So I think uh, we're gonna have to have another committee. I can't wait to sign up for that another two years. Let's just start it off right now. So if I can respond, Laura, if you put a battery storage system 10 feet from my property line, I would say not in my backyard, not in your backyard, it's not but safe. Yeah. But Janet, no, because they're going on rooftops of Kohl's, of Amazon. They're going on, like, I, I wanted to say, like, we're in a microcosm here in Amherst. These systems with the right technology are going up everywhere because there's, there's not a, and they're actually, like, when you look at the amount of, like, for example, when you look at, like, the fire, when fires happen, I don't know this technology that's mentioned here. Like mostly I see like Fluence or Tesla or things like more known technologies. But um, but there's so many of them that we're focusing on like the bad examples. And I'm not saying it's not possible, but in my mind, if the risk is fire, then the, the de fire department just needs to know, let it burn, don't touch it. The risk is explosion if you open it, right? And I think we all know that now. Um, but when these things burn, I don't know if you, you know, like, anyways, I just, I don't want to argue with you, but I, I wouldn't say not in my backyard. You know, I have a giant electric battery in my garage right now. That is exactly the same technology as what we're talking about here. Um, so if, if you research this, you have people in California whose cars are, you know, their Tesla ignites and burns their whole house down. This is well, actually my husband's field. And I was talking to him and he goes, yeah, we only had one fire. Fortunately, it was at the bus depot. It wasn't when the bus was in motion. And so that's happened to other companies. This is a technology that, you know, and, and you know, every manufacturer isn't the same. So I do think we need to say all battery systems must safely contain fires and thermal runaway oh, yeah. and prevent the release of toxic fumes. I think the hundred foot thing, if you lived, you know, it's like a hundred feet isn't that far. It's windy around here. If there is fires, then... You have leaves blowing and you, you know you you have you what know happens, that, but what happens Janet your thesis of like we want things on roofs and things like that if it's contained and it's fireproof someone wants to put it on the roof 
you know, a, a, a building owner says, you know what, I'm comfortable. Like we're seeing a lot of this. I'm just, I, I think, I think what you said is good about the first, uh, um, the safety requirements. I don't see any issues with that, but as far as like setbacks right now, I'm not comfortable saying that because I'm just not seeing it right now. I'm seeing it like really embedded in daily life for people. So. Well, these are, we're talking about large scale ground mounted that, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, so that's that, what I, yeah, no, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, like five megawatt systems on top of large commercial rooftops. Or but that's like, actually, our bylaw doesn't cover that. Our bylaw is talking about ground mounted. Well, okay, even, even ground mounted. I'm saying like, we're drawing from the limited experience of like the fires that have occurred. And I'm, I'm, I'm literally just telling you, I just came back from New York where I just looked at six five megawatt projects cited all in Manhattan, you know, so, and then are approved by fire departments are going forward. So I just don't think, I, I'm not in a place to say the setback should be this, like I'm not an expert on this. So I think, I don't necessarily think we're disagreeing, but I don't yeah. see the same amount of fear that you, I, I just, I'm not comfortable saying it should be this setback or this setback. I just think it needs to be safe, whatever the guidelines is, that's what it should be. That's what it should be. That's my opinion, so. All right. Do we have any um, uh, sort of thoughts about how we should move forward with this section? I, I'm sort of getting the sense that it should be a, a more general statements at that high level that um, I think Janet had sort of put forward um, and maybe just leave it at that uh, with some reference to then the um, uh, potential uh, battery, standalone battery bylaw. Go ahead, Martha. Yes, well, I mean, just for comparison, I just want us to remember that the space shuttle program was 98% effective. And that sounds like a great record until the Challenger explosion, right? And so here, yes, fires are rare, but they do happen and I feel pretty strongly that we've got to have at least some standard things right in here um, in our bylaw, uh, recognizing that at the present time, fires can happen and they can be disastrous if they do. The reason for the setbacks was because the fires in New York State and other places have in fact caused leaks of, of toxic gases or leaks of toxic material that then could go down into the water supply. And you know, the when foams with PFAS have been used and so on by fire departments, they have gotten into water supplies. That was the reason for the 400 feet. So I would, my suggestion would be that we add a beginning paragraph in this section that says two concepts. One, that yes, there's going to be a battery, general battery, battery storage bylaw coming, but the two, uh, the statements about how, you know, we hope by in ensuing years, by the end of a decade, uh, the problem of battery fires will have been, you know, researched and taken care of, but for the present time, because we've seen examples of the lithium iron, fires that have been very serious. We have to have this included, have those two statements, then have the list of these general things, omitting uh, the specific ones about having the water and how far from trees and so on. But I would say keeping the, the um, 400 feet from wells statement in there and just um, let it go. Because alternatively, Mr. Chairman, we may need another meeting because we are not getting through this in a timely manner, and we do have other things to discuss. Yeah. Uh, not to mention, you know, the the whole next steps and procedures is something that's new, and we do need some time to discuss because at least I have a few uh, questions about that process. So, either so how we how can we um, resolve? Kind of, yeah. So, what do you want to do here? I would suggest we sort of minimize this section to the to that sort of um, higher level statement of these are the goals that um, we that that um, zoning should espouse to uh, with regard to 
uh, of uh, minimizing or reducing uh, potential uh, fires and so forth. Um, it should reference the other the other uh, bylaw forthcoming. Um, I think to Laura's point, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to put in any spe spe specs in there with regard to distances and so forth. Um, uh, cause I don't think we have sort of that knowledge base wow. is my own thought. Um, yes, we do. We have quite a bit of knowledge actually. Well, 400 <laughs> feet, uh, I don't know where 400 feet came from versus a hundred feet. I thought a hundred feet was in here. Uh, no, a hundred, a hundred feet is for the overall, um, from solar trees. Array. the 400 feet comes from the I think it's the National Fire Protection uh, literature plus the the writings on the uh, explosions and toxic releases that have occurred with batteries that you don't want them within 400 feet of a water supply. Um, go ahead, Jack, and then we'll try to wrap this up. Yeah. I just wonder if we could take a small break. <laughs> um, midway yeah. further yeah. delay our progress but uh yeah. necessary yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes yeah sounds good jack <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um yeah. well it's um chris is occupied there i just want to get let me just look at my draft of how much more we have here yeah we have the whole introduction that got rewritten that, that we need to go back and address to rest of it is I think we've gone through a fair amount um okay but after this section there might not be much more yeah um well are people I wouldn't mind resolving the storage thing and then we can take a break yeah um, unless people want to ponder on it over a five minute break I'm I'm sorry I missed um <laughs> like a couple of sentences of that discussion was there a conclusion that was reached no, other than to potentially so, take a break. <laughs> um, I right. think, uh, can I make, I don't know. Go ahead, Laura. I don't know what the motion is right now, but like. There's no motion. Yeah. Um, well, no, I might make one. That's what I'm saying. Yep. I think, uh, I, you know, um, what I'm hearing, and tell me if I'm wrong with Martha and Jenna and, and others, is to, I mean, maybe I'm actually totally wrong, but what I, what my vote would be to just keep it broad at a high level, what Janet had indicated before in referencing third parties that have far more expertise than we do. And I know we like to think we're experts in this, but we're definitely not. Like I've been in this space for 17 years and like I'm learning about battery storage, new things like this in this recent meeting, it's like, oh, interesting. So I just, I vote, we rewrite it very high level and, um, and I think that's the best we can do right now because we're, you know, already six months over. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but on a high level, what does that mean? Because I would, I would say that numbers, that Janet's statement plus numbers one and two, uh, and maybe. Yeah, I think that's fine. And then just you know, I would as, like to see included. Yeah. That would. Be yeah, I'm good yeah. with one and two. Yeah, and I think so too. And then as amended when new information comes out i mean basically you know what i mean it's like yeah. those two things and you know this acknowledging that um you know uh -huh. that new research and guidance is going to be presented to the market so we just need to stay on top of it all right yeah. are we um good generally with that and um, um yeah. and, and chris do you is that enough for you to work with uh yeah. or, mm -hmm. okay yeah, yeah. It's, so as long as as those you know a couple of most important things get get included and and then would a couple of general statements and uh, um, yep yeah I, I have a question if I could just jump in I mean I wouldn't mind taking your break either but didn't the hundred feet come from Chris Bascom my the fire. Chris, I th he he feet. actually didn't have that hundred feet. No, he said ten feet. Oh, um, so we kind yeah. of overrode his recommendation and said 
that right. doesn't sound like enough. Let's go with a hundred feet. So um, I kind of we're discussing this before. So I'm kind of yeah. Know, I can send you his email. No, I, I very I trust you. I trust you. Yeah. I, I remember that. Yeah. So let's yep. not okay. talk about feet because I just think let's keep it. If you feel good about that, Chris, then join I know I'm sure you'll find, create great language at the end of the day. I mean, another okay. alternative is to have Chris go off <laughs> and uh, do the redo this section based on our comments and then email it to us uh, to ask whether you know we have. We approve the general language. Let's it's try to avoid that. I, I think I think we gave Chris enough a, a okay. general statement and the numbers one okay. and two, um, uh, and um, and I think that we'll we'll cover it. Um, okay, um, let's right. let's Great. let's um, uh, start up at this the, at the next section here, but after a five minute break. Yeah, is that okay Let's for folks? Um, so at one. Uh, uh, 33 or so, yeah. uh, we'll reconvene. Yeah. Okay. Dwayne, Dwayne, could I just take a minute then with, with, with you again, trying to be the timekeeper or something? It seems to me that most of the rest of this from, uh, you know, from here to the end were things that we discussed yeah. and pretty much agreed upon some month, you know, weeks to months ago. And I'm wondering if we could just ask if anybody has any specific comments of any of those sections from then to page 25. Um, I would, with the exception of whether Chris specifically wants us to um, provide some input to her on any of the sections that she's yes. worked on and, and, and kind of added stuff, but wasn't really fully confident that we would all be on board. Yeah, but okay, but but just you'll see how the the time is running, and then the one section that I am concerned about is that the read the introduction. You know, Steve yeah. added a lot of uh, new ideas and things that yeah. we never discussed, and that I therefore really question. Uh, you know, again, it's last minute that stuff got added, and we don't have time to discuss. So I, I'd like to do that. And then the process that we have. Yeah, yeah. and that's pretty well. Uh, laid out. We really yeah. need to have some time and not just try to, you know, do that in the last 35 minutes. So that would be my concerns there. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. let's go. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Take a break. <laughs>
All right, everybody. Um, maybe you can just put your um, video on just so we know where who's back. Awesome. All right, great. All right, so the plan if now is we have an hour and a half. I'd like to leave at least a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes even, to go through the next steps um, and the um, and and hear from public comments at the end. Um, and so uh, I don't know how many pages, but we have a decent number of pages, but much much of this we've um, have been through before. So uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, with um, Chris's um, guidance here is really to um, look at the different sections, uh, but really just look at them holistically, um, ask if there's any comments or concerns by the group, ask Chris if you had any specific sections um, that you still need it, uh, and want input on, uh, um, and then we can go to the next section and then and then uh, um, finish this out um, in um, fairly efficiently. Uh, so, uh, whoops, I'm looking over here, but can we? Um, is that sound okay? Um, then we can uh, maybe reshare this, share the screen again, and work through the stormwater management section, which I think we've been through, but there's some added stuff here. Uh, so do you want me to just so. share from where we left off, where I scrolled I through? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's basically I'll where we're. That. Yeah, exactly. So stormwater management, I have to say that it's unusual to have a section on stormwater management in the zoning bylaw because generally speaking, that's handled by um, best practices with um, DEP and also um, the Conservation Commission. But we do have this you know, pretty robust section on um, stormwater management in here. And it refers to a lot of the things that we already do, um, state and local laws relating to this. And then we make reference to a specific document. I think it's on the next page. Yeah. Um, the Minnesota Stormwater Manu Manual that um, talks about uh, not, you know, undermining soils during construction activities. Um, so I think, you know, we really have quite a lot in here, much more than is uh, typical. Um, I don't necessarily think we have to go over any of it um, unless other people want to. I Just a point of clarification, I guess, on, on these bullets under Minnesota, are all those bullets from this Minnesota? No. Manual? Or, the, or no. the, yeah, okay. Um, the, the, the Minnesota manual really goes to the bit, uh, bullet right before projects that are unable to minimize disturbance or grading activities may employ soil landscape restoration and soil amendments such as those described in the following document. And the okay. following document is the Man Minnesota stormwater manual, which doesn't really have any force of law in Massachusetts, but it's more of a reference for people yeah. to okay. see, oh, you could do it this way. Okay. okay, so the remainder of these bullets are just a continuation of the bullets from before. That's right. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So unless anyone feels like we need to go over these, I don't think I need to go over them. Um, and then the next section I is- did about... have, I did have, let me just, I mean, like the bullet down uh, towards like three quarters of the way down that says the lowest vertical clearance of a solar array panel shall be an elevation of 10 feet or less. Um, I think that has to do with people fearing that if it's any higher, it's going to have a more detrimental effect when water hits it and it's going to hit the ground at a you know greater uh, velocity. Okay, so 10 feet or less. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the dual use arrays need to be up at least 8 to 10 feet. Um, I didn't understand that, but I felt like it was way out of my wheelhouse so if it makes sense to people in the industry then it 
it's fine, but I didn't understand what was where. <laughs> and we do say heights greater than 10 feet shall be approved by the PGA. So there's an out there. Okay. You don't have to adhere to the 10 feet if you get permission from the PGA. Okay. 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 All right. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Jack, right. sorry, mm -hmm. before we go. Yeah, just uh, from recollection, uh, the, the white paper from the Water Supply Protection Committee spoke to this as being important. Uh, the unique nature of, of solar developments uh, covering a larger uh, area, uh, not not in, as intensive di uh, disturbance as a as a residential development, but uh, it tends to have you know a wider uh, expanse, and and so and obviously the the uh, the issues that we've seen in the region uh, stem from poor uh, stormwater management you know, practices and, and monitoring and follow up and all those sorts of things. So obviously I, I'm, I'm good with, you know, not overreaching anything here, but, you know, stating how important this is to the success of the project. Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. I already had misread that. So I apologize for that. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Then we have um, protection of drinking water supplies. And this came from the um, white paper. Uh, yeah. So they had a list of things that they wanted to make sure we included, and I think I included all of them. Um, yep. They had a diff. They differed from us in our slope. That you know, we had said that we would allow solar arrays on slopes up to fifteen percent, and they said they would allow sl solar arrays on slopes up to thirty-three percent. Um, so I stuck with the fifteen percent here. Um, then they uh, talked about synthetic pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Um, and Scott Cashin had something to say about that. I think he said it in a, in a different context, but um, let's see. What did he say? Not within 150 feet of wetlands or other sensitive natural communities. Same applies for refueling of equipment. Oh, that's a different comment. I'm sorry. Um, so organic pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers may be used if necessary. You know, I, I'm i not really sure what we should say about that. Janet brought up the issue of whether this conflicts with state law and the, um, I forget what it's called, the Pesticides Something Act, Control Act. Is that right, Janet? Pesticides Control Act. I the think federal that act is like FIFA or something like that. I can't remember the name of the state act, but yeah. So maybe we shouldn't have these things in yellow here um, in our bylaw because they are superseded by the state. Um, I think we also had a, something when we talked about ecosystem services that um, uh, um, pesticides, I believe, were to be um, not used unless approved by the PGA. Oh, right. Yep. So I, I think that is probably good language more so than just banning them here. Yeah, I, I think this is an issue we should have the town attorney, you know, say can't do that or here's a way to reword it or something. But um, yeah, I think I think the state law preempts local regulation, but I'm not sure of all the contours of that. Right. In fact, I sent an email to him, to one of the town attorneys, and they responded saying they agreed with Janet that we shouldn't, you know, talk about use of synthetic, we, sh we shouldn't talk about use of pesticides and fertilizers. So right. that Jack, probably needs to be clarified. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, oh, just a okay. comment from Jack. Yeah, I agree uh, with what everyone's saying, you know, adequately re regulated elsewhere. We don't need to to be, you know, stating specifics within this bylaw. Okay. Um, there shall be no oil hazardous materials, cleansers, or other potential contaminants stored in no disturbed areas, nor within wetlands or other sensitive area, natural communities, nor within 150 feet of wetlands or other sensitive natural communities, nor shall there be any refueling of equipment, maintenance activities in these areas. That all seems reasonable to me. That was something that was contributed by Scott Cashin. Um, yes, I'm and... just going to jump in real quick with, you know, distances for mm -hmm. wetlands. I think we need to refer to our, 
own wetlands bylaw in terms of setbacks and distances. Um, so you might, I think we can, I think this will just get flagged for something that our wetlands administrator would review. Okay. Maybe it should say just within a distance, it's um, uh, as specified by the Wetlands Act. Or you can say the buffer zone of the wetland, right? Is that? Um, well, you know, so I think zone... um, Stephanie's right. We should have Erin look at this and she'll tell us what to say. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then this last thing, I wasn't sure if nearby within X feet, private wells run dry, the owner operator of the LGPI shall study the case causes and if found to be caused by the LGPI, the owner operator shall take necessary steps to rem remedy the problem. I'm not sure the, how that would um, be revealed. I suppose it would be revealed if someone who had a well in the vicinity uh, complained about the well running dry and- so yeah, so I, you know, I, a lot of the people who have attended have been, you know, on private wells, and there's a lot of concern about this. And if the array doesn't affect private wells, it won't. Um, it's not unheard of for wells to run dry in really dry times. Um, so I, I was trying to, I was sort of thinking this through, like, how do we address that concern? And, you know, you don't want to put it all on the private well landowners because that could be, you know, like you could, they could sue them for a nuisance and then there's all this discovery and blah, blah, blah. And that's a huge financial burden, um, you know, to put it on the private landowners. But if it, if the, if, you know, the um, solar array did affect how the ground absorbed water and distributed it, then they should fix that. And so that's, this language is trying to see like, to make sure those private well owners are protected. And I, I was trying to like kind of, and I figured the deeper pocket is gonna be the array and possibly the cause. And then, you know, if it's just a dry season, I doubt anyone's gonna complain about that because they've had that experience. So I was trying to think about what happens if the array is diverting, you know, cause you're collecting all your um, surface water and you're putting it into a, a holding retention tank, but maybe that's doing that diverting it to that is actually preventing from the groundwater from naturally recharging. And we, no one's going to do that before the array is put in, but what if the effect is that way? So that was my thinking. I was trying to like address to interests and, and make sure they're protected. Okay. Uh, Jack and then Dan, Jack and then Dan. Yeah. I just want to say that I, I, we really can't have that, that last bullet there. Uh, we, we've established that conversion of uh, solar uh, from either grassland or forest is going to enhance groundwater recharge. So this, and again, also, and then also this is like just putting someone legally something that needs to be determined outside of, you know, cause of, of well problems is a very... <laughs> <laughs> tricky business which i'm you know yeah. involved with on yes. all the time so I, I don't think we want that that in here i, I don't think we're going to need it uh but also i just think it's going to open up uh a, a lot of liability unnecessary liability for the developer yeah dan dan uh yeah jack said basically what i was gonna say there's there's no reason why we should there's no reason, reasonable explanation for why a solar array could reduce, uh, could lower water levels in an aquifer. Um, and so creating that kind of, um, yeah, it's just an unreasonable requirement because well, there, there, there's, there's no explanation for why that could possibly be the case. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I'm, you know, yeah. there is a you do have a private cause of action in nuisance when you know your the next door neighbor affects you, so that's still there. So I'm I'm willing to withdraw it, but I was trying to think of something, and I don't think we can predict how water moves underground, and it, it doesn't seem inconceivable. We can predict how water moves underground. Yeah, actually, there's a what I do for a living. Field of know, but, <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, so I'm willing to withdraw it, but I was trying to think of a way to address concerns, and you know. I, I'm I, I agree with Jack and Dan. There's no expectation that this would be an issue or we shouldn't anticipate raise expectation that it should be an issue. If anything, there should be more recharge. I don't 
assuming they follow the rules of vegetation and so forth, uh, there's going to be plenty of recharge or not collecting water and storing it away for the most part. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I let's, I, unless anybody objects further, I, I'd just suggest we start okay. this section. Okay. This bullet. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Let's continue. Sorry, I was muted. Um, go down to reporting. Yep. Um, so during construction, uh, third party inspector um, shall submit reports on a weekly basis and after large storm events. Um, and then Scott Cashin had recommended some language. Let's see what he said. Um, need to specify what should be reported in this weekly report, um, status of construction activities, BMPs, stormwater controls, any issues of how those issues are being addressed and the timeline for implementation. There needs to be a mechanism for ensuring any construction related issues are promptly addressed. Um, and then he's re reviewed lots of these monitoring reports. So if you want me to, I can add uh, language to that effect. I didn't have time to, you know, kind of like w figure out what the wording would be. Should I add I that language? I think for good writing, it would be helpful to, to have some specificity of what should be in that report. Um, okay. Maybe it should be, um, uh, you know, caveated by uh, as as prescribed, you know, for example, these things, uh, but as determined by the PGA. Okay. I'm sorry, Dwayne, I, I, you're saying this language and then say as determined by the PGA? The PGA would, would, would list what what they want in the report, and they could the base language, it on these yeah. things. Yeah, but like the language could okay. include uh, such such as these okay. various things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, post. Oh, let's see. No, there's something added there. Post construction, the owner or operator of an LPG LGPI shall submit a report with photographs within 48 hours of a large storm event. So this is after construction is finished. The report shall describe any evidence of erosion and sedimentation and the condition of ground surface soils, ground cover, stormwater devices. And if remedial actions are needed, the report shall discuss the proposed remedial actions. So how long does this go on? Does this go on, you know, for the remainder of the life of the solar array? Or does it um, only... Is it for five years or so? It, can you yeah. scroll up a bit, um, Stephanie, to this? Uh, yeah. Yes. There. There we go. So, what do you? What do people think about that? Yeah, I would taking into account that large rain events are probably going to become pretty numerous in the next twenty, thirty years. <laughs> while these Seriously. projects are out there, uh, and that um, once these sites are est well established, they should be fine, or at least no worse off than the rest of the meadows and fields that we have. Uh, so I guess, I mean, my inclination would be to limit it to like the first year. I mean, sorry, the first five years. First five years. I think that's right. Yep. Without objection. Okay. Um, now what's the next one? Um, I, I don't know if I have an objection, if I can jump in. So I was at one of the arrays in Amherst and it's been around for a bunch of years. And a lot of the um, erosion control devices were sort of torn and you could see there was runoff and mud and stuff. And I wondered, you know, I, I've no, I, I can't remember if it's this bylaw or something, but just saying, oh, inspect it yearly. I don't know if you should inspect it after every storm event, you know, given that that could be like 20 times a year. But I think that we can't just say, oh, your your erosion control device things are in, and then 15 years later, really expect that the fabric or the tubing and stuff is still there. So I think I'd like to see like looking at it at least twice a year, three four times a year. I'm assuming their people are on site, but when I went to this um, array in North Amherst, I had popped over once, and it was like these things look kind of worn. And after a big storm, they were like there were whole sections that were kind of broken open, and I wondered, you know what's the monitoring of it? You know, the array is still working. It's just the erosion control. Some of the areas weren't. And so how do you require people to look regularly enough to keep your, you know, your erosion control in good condition? 
may I say something? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. So the er the erosion control is really just supposed to be there until the final inspection, and once the final inspection occurs, all of that erosion control, those silt fences, and those tubes and everything can be taken off the site, and then you rely on your permanent um, stormwater management uh, construction, whatever that is, um, you know, detention basins and, and swales and things like that. So the fact that those things were in a ragged shape, in my opinion, means that nobody ever bothered to remove them rather than that they were now non-functional because they don't need to be functional anymore if the site has been um, declared to be finished. All right, Laura. Yeah, no, my comment is, um, I think, um, you know, to Chris's point, whatever we normally do for installations after the final building permits in place is what we should do here. I don't think there's any reason to say you put up a new residential building and we don't, and, you know, we don't require reports moving forward all of a sudden solar. We have to, you know, do more reporting and follow up. So I, I, you know, I, I personally think that, um, you know, it's just it's, it's seeming a little onerous. That's all. Um, so after that final inspection's in place, I don't see the need for regular ongoing reports. Unless we do it for something else, I stand corrected if we do. But you know, if we if we don't, then I don't see why we should impose additional rules here. Well, I think then the permit would be requiring that you know, surface waters don't have erosion. So is that, that's common for, you know, a subdivision permit and things like that, right, Chris? The Conservation Commission would have such conditions if it had anything to do with a wetland and the Planning Board or the Zoning Board of Appeals could impose such conditions if if they had jurisdiction, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, um, all right, let's see. Modifications, there's not much change there. The yep. word substantial was added, I think. Um, so we don't really need to talk about that too much. Oh, on page uh, 27, abandonment or decommissioning. Any LGPI, so this is something Martha brought up, but it was also something raised by Scott Cashin um, talking about um, nameplate capacity is somewhat misleading because nameplate capacity has to do with the capacity that something is um, is is deemed to have in a factory setting. Whereas when you're actually out in the field because of um, where you are in terms of like where the sun is and what your slope is and all kinds of other things and and where you are in terms of latitude i guess um the nameplate nameplate capacity is never realized and so there's this capacity factor which martha has drawn us our attention to um and so when we say when something is operating at less than 25 percent of its nameplate capacity well in fact most of these arrays operate at you know, 14 to 16% of their nameplate capacity. So um, no, no. I think, is that wrong? No, no. Yeah. well, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. <laughs> so how do we deal with this issue, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the array does have, and a nameplate capacity is a well not known thing that a, a, a solar project will have a designated nameplate capacity. It's how many kilowatts or megawatts uh, it is in terms of its total capacity and and how much it would generate on at full sun, at noon, on a clear day. I think it might have to be on the equator. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, uh, that's that's your capacity. It's it's you know except for those rare times when it's perfectly clear and it's noon. Uh, and it's facing exactly the 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 array. It, it's never going to be operating at that full capacity, but it's going to be operating closely. But it's always going to be operating at zero percent of its nameplate capacity every day in the middle of the night. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, saying that it has to operate, if I, I think it's not correct to say operating at less than twenty five percent of its nameplate capacity, because it's it's 
it's operating at different capacities all the time. But it's also not correct to say less than 25% of its capacity factor, because also the capacity factor is, is really has to be looked at over the course of a year, uh, because um, a project in Massachusetts would generally have like a 14% capacity factor, but it has a zero, it's operating at a 0% capacity in the middle of the night. It's operating generally at much at close to 100% uh, capacity factor in the middle of the summer on a clear day. Uh, but over the course of the year, it averages out to about 13, 14% in Massachusetts. Um, so I think the intent of this section was to uh, require or at least proceed with some removal requirements if the thing is kind of abandoned and ju or just not operating anywhere near its abilities, um, less than 25% of its ability. Um, but that, I don't think either nameplate capacity or capacity factor quite get us there. My my suggestion would just be to say average capacity factor. That seems to be the term that's used. Well, I would say, well, and also keep in mind that a, a project does not have a spec on it that's give, that says states its capacity factor, like a nameplate capacity. Um, that's, yeah, the panel are they I'm going to say, aren't they reporting their annual like output to the board? Or I don't know if output is the right word. Yeah. Well, they generate, they they um, report their output to uh, the state and to the New England Generation Information System, but that's not necessarily public information, I don't think. I thought they reported it to the planning board or the, the board for some reason, but maybe I'm, I'm lost in the sauce here. I think that's um, agricultural capacity, oh, uh, agricultural oh. production, not um, right. production of electricity. I, I mean, if we said annual, days. if it's operating at less than 25%, uh, if, if it's operating an annual less than 25% of an of a 14% capacity factor over the course of a year, uh, then that would, um, uh, I think, but, would do what you needed, we wanted it to do. Yeah, but... Of course, we don't want to wait a year. If can't we just say average capacity factor? Doesn't that just cover it, it? It, the capacity factor changes daily and seasonally? Yes, but if you say average, average over what period of time? Okay. You need well. you need you need sort of a year, I think, <laughs> to get that full of. I mean, we're not going to you know if it's. I think you need at least a year before you tell somebody to remove it because it's not under it's underperforming. Yeah, we just want some, I guess, just some means of saying, well, it's just giving out dribbles and drabs now. It's not really functioning well. I don't know how you say that. <laughs> well, it, I I did provide a, an, a suggestion to Chris. Uh, oh. was basically, it, it's a, it, I think it's commonly accepted that capacity factors for solar projects in Massachusetts are about 14% over the course of a year. I don't think uh, Laura could opine on that, but I think that's generally accepted and and derived by DOER each year. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you want to say if it's operating, if it, if the output is less than 25% of its name play capacity times 8,760 hours in a year <laughs> times 14% over the course of a year, over the course of the year, then then you're you're you're, you're going to be um, subject to this paragraph. Hmm. Okay. I don't think we want to subject anybody to this unless there's like a, <laughs> a year a year's worth of uh, data. Does this happen often? <laughs> Not really. I mean, there's a lot of money at stake here. There. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that you'd have a huge incentive to keep you know your panels up to date and going. Um, it's almost like I mean, there's a catastrophic know. failure for some reason. I, I don't. I I don't know. You it's know, possible that you run out of money for replacing worn out panels or something. But you know, the inverter. Yeah. Yeah. No, not not possible. I haven't seen it. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> not possible financially. Sure, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I think that you know these are so valuable that once they get put in, they're gonna stay for decades and decades and be upgraded. It makes sense to me. 
So, you know. I think, I mean, I guess there's a question then, do we need anything here um, or is it gonna, but I think, um, I guess the purpose was under a rare occurrence that uh, it just been abandoned for some reason, maybe it's operated for 25 years and um, nobody wants to keep it up <laughs> uh, and I it think, goes. I think it's good to have this in here. Yeah, it gives the building commissioners some um, yeah. bench benchmark. So I would just put the equation in that that or verbally the fit the number equation or just the verbal equation in there and just move on. I, you know, I think it's not going to be very frequent, and we shouldn't spend hours looking at it. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I um, think it would make if people understand the terminology, it makes sense. Okay. 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 Let's move on to um, the next page, the top of the next page, um, D. Any site that was deforested for the installation shall be restored and native growth shall be reestablished, including the planting of seedlings. Um, and then this requirement may be waived if the landowner submits a plan for reuse of the site as a solar array or other use, for example, as agricultural use. So that seems to make sense to me. He doesn't have to replant all the seedlings if he's going to reuse it, right? Um, yeah. Okay, the next paragraph has to do with abandonment. I don't think we have a lot to talk about there. Um, next paragraph about financial surety to mm -hmm. cover the cost of construction and installation. So construction and installation is the same thing, but we could have both of those words there. I don't have a problem with that. And removal. I'm not sure why I said that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, then all possible salvage for solar panels mm -hmm. shall be included. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Okay. Um, all right. Um, next page. Um, let's see. Um, so an appeal from the decision of the building commissioner must be filed within 30 days. That's already part of our um, zoning bylaw rules and regulations. And I think it's probably also in the zoning bylaw. Yeah. yeah. So I actually wanted that because nobody knows this. You know? So everybody's okay. like, oh, you can't, you can't appeal a site plan review permit, but you can appeal the building commissioner's permit. So I just thought, you know, I'd, I'd love to have, because we often have an appeal section in the zoning bylaw and they never talk about the appeal of the building commissioner permit. So, so this uh, isn't wrong. It's just something that's repeated elsewhere. So yeah, might as well and, leave it in. Yeah. Um, the, the following, you know, m many line item was submitted by Scott Cashin and I don't know if we want to go over it now. It's very long. Um, following comments and requirements. So protection of water quality. Um, anyway, I think it's more detailed than is normally um, found in a zoning bylaw, but I wanted to make sure that you saw this in case you thought it was necessary to include this. Yeah, well, may, may I interrupt to say that now we have only 50 minutes left in our standard meeting and clearly we're either going to need to agree here that it's okay if we run longer than three o'clock to get through, or we're going to have to set up an additional brief meeting, I think. So. Well, um, I think that's persevere. I think, uh, you know, my so sense is with persevere. this final language with Scott, yeah. with Scott Cashin, I would yep. suggest we add that to the set of comments that we received. Yes. Yes. Most, I, all I this think seems very detailed yeah. to me. That, yep kind of don't really belong in the bylaw more so maybe in some permitting documents. Um, so if we're good with that, then I think we've expired um, our review of the bylaw and we can go back. Uh, I think we, there was some interest in going back to the top to look at some of the earlier statements, but let's give that 15 minutes, 15 minutes to look at the process and, and 15 minutes for any public comments and try to be done today. Um, let me go with Je uh, Chris. Go ahead. What do we want to do about the battery storage section? I thought we'd said we were going to. Yeah. 
make a make a a, a general uh, kind of uh, set of statements there with a few of the of the key. The one and two, particularly. No, I th I yeah. think I oh, think we said separate... we were going to have a separate section on battery energy storage systems, and I have prepared such a section, and I was hoping at some point to have a review of that. But if you feel like that's not going to happen, then. Um, I did see that in the packet. I wasn't sure whether that was that in our charge, I guess. <laughs> so <laughs> initially, mm -hmm. we we understood that we weren't um, being asked to come up with regulations for battery storage. Um, and our attorney confirmed that, or he confirmed the fact that battery energy storage was not um, protected by um, Chapter 40A, Section 3. But then um, during the course of the year, um, we became aware that battery storage is protected by Chapter 40A, Section 3. So we decided that we should have a battery energy storage bylaw. But um, so anyway, I did prepare one. If you maybe there's no time to review it today and maybe I should just submit it. I don't think there's a lot of controversy in it. Um, and maybe I should just submit it to town council along with the solar bylaw and, you know, suggest that they refer it to CRC for, um, you know, refinement and development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yep, I think that's, that's, that's good by me, but, I, uh, uh, Jack and then Janet. Hi. Yeah, I just. I agree, uh, Dwayne, with what you uh, had said, uh, what you had proposed. <clears throat> um, I agree. I agree. Janet? So I, I, just, I, I agree that the Scott Cashin comments, you know, were really handy, but very late in the process. And it seemed like handy tips for every construction project. So I, I think that should be included, you know, as like kind of expert consultants ads. And we shouldn't talk about it now. Um, I think we're at a wrap, but I but I do think um, Chris, I just it would be make sense to go back to me, or at least I'm a little unclear about the battery storage section in Article 17. So we agreed to take the first two or three plus my sentence, I think, um, and and then, I, but you know, so I, I think that's okay. I think that's the agreement. I don't have any. I don't. I, I thought that we were going to do battery storage in like the town charge looks, the town council charge talks about that, but we just haven't done it. And so I don't want to say, yes, I support this Bible that I've never read or researched or compared to others. And so I think we just put it on the list of things that we didn't get to, which is actually fairly long. You know, it took us a long way to get here. So I, I don't, you know, we don't have time to go through the battery, you know, the, the separate best thing. And so um, I, you know, I, I, and I really don't want to go back to do the intent and purpose section, which I think we've read through three times and comments oh. have come in too late in the process. And, but it's, it's not, it's not, our process is not the end of the process. And so those comments can come in later to town council or CRC or planning board or whoever the lucky people are who, you know, get this next, you know, and so, yeah. All right. I'd love to move along to okay. it. Like a That's, um, that's good. Let me just ask. Uh, I think Martha particularly had, and maybe you can be very specific and 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 on very, on some any specific things you had uh, mm -hmm. to discuss on the uh, intent section, uh, intent and purpose section that were have been added, uh, and then I think we can um, wrap up, uh, make it a wrap, as Janet said on this on this bylaw, and then move on to the process. Okay. Yes, well, I am. I'm quite concerned that just within this past week, a number of comments and edits and changes have been made in the intent and purpose section that we had already gone through a few times over, reviewed, and thought we had final. Uh, and so all these edits were inserted by somebody who's not a member of our working group and introducing some concepts that we've never discussed, things that are not really relevant here. So I would like to then just to try to quicken, th quicken things up. Um, I move 
let's see here. I move that we accept the intent and purpose section and the nexus statements about the forests uh, from the previous wording in the previous version dated CV 10.9.23. So is there a second to that? Well, I think we'd have to look at, at what we're- Yeah, I mean, I ask this, this is just if we want to move things along. Otherwise, I, I agree. I'd like to yeah, discuss I, it line I'd like by to look line. The language real quick, Martha, but I agree that we do not have the time or bandwidth to review all of the extensive additional comments that have been added yeah. um, and put our name on it and say we signed off, so. I agree. Yeah, yeah, because there are things about, you know, uh, the the DOER document and their, uh, you know, plans A and B and so on that we've never discussed and we'd okay, have so to- Just to be clear, Martha, that. your, your motion uh, is re referring strictly and solely to the um, change ch to eliminate the ch the changes that have forthcome in and only in the the nexus statement for forest lands in the okay. intent and purpose section and the section nexus statement for forest lands where there was simply one sentence removed and leave them as they were worded in the previous version dated uh, CB 10.9.23. Okay, I just want clarity on exactly what uh, yeah. sections we're looking at, because are, there are some sort of sections in the intent and purpose that aren't with regard to forest that I think are useful additions. Right. So yeah. I think Martha is referring to additions that were made by Steve Roof, yes. and that would include um, this section here that's shown in red, starting in as a result in 2019 and ending in uh, 2050. So that's one section that she would have us not accept. And then in the paragraph below, this bylaw aims to balance multiple needs. There are several things that were added um, by Steve Roof in that section, um, which I did put, uh, I really, you know, I made reference to those out in the right hand margin. And then if you move on to the following page, um, those are all additions by Steve Roof um, up to need to implement through that paragraph. And then, um, then there was an, another paragraph um, where he was encouraging us to consider encouraging uh, installations on parcels that are rated A or B in the Massachusetts um, technical potential of solar study. And then he was encouraging us to take out that statement. Oh, maybe I took it out because it, or he yeah, suggested yeah. taking it out because um, it, it, it was like it. Yeah. repetitive. And yeah. then, oh, and then there was a sentence about, um, this article strives to encourage and regulate solar and energy facilities in a manner that reflects the equity and justice of the impacts and opportunities across all sectors of Amherst's residents with particular concern to our low-income and marginalized communities. So his comment there is that um, there's really nothing in our bylaw that addresses this concern or this issue. And I tend to agree with him on that. Um, so, but anyway. Okay, um, I guess just I'll state my own opinion first, I, I, and then we'll go uh, and try to do this quickly. Um, I guess I um, I agree with some of the specificity the uh, on, on the on the forest land. I think it's a bit of a late addition to start thinking about using the DOER technical potential study and the grading system that they used and so forth. Uh, the one thing I would push back on is I think it was a missing. Um, and important and non-controversial statements to have at the very beginning with regard to um, being in line with the town greenhouse gas goal as a motivating purpose for this uh, uh, bylaw. Uh, yeah, that the first section um, and to be consistent uh, and, and the, the um, 
being uh, cognizant and uh, supportive of the Commonwealth goals as well. I don't see why we wouldn't have that as part of our purpose and intent. Uh, and it's kind of generic and, and more uh, vanilla, if you will, uh, but also really important co um, context. Um, yeah. Okay, okay so um, let me hear from Laura. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you said. I think this first piece right here under intent and purpose, these are just facts. You know, I mean, I, I don't see, none of this really seems controversial to me. I think that's why we're all here. Um, and I do think it's a shame you still uh, when we talk about GOER. I mean, it's consistent with the state. I'm fine if the group hasn't had a chance to research further down. The, uh, right. anyways, the GOER parcels A and B, yeah, right here. It's, I, I hear you, Martha. Um, it's all, you know, I get if we haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, but I do agree with the way that it was a, an oversight to not come out and say that. But the first piece, I think, I don't think any of this is, um, I think it's just some, at least that intro piece is actually just adds to our document as opposed to adding anything controversial. All right, good. Um, Jack and then Janet. Yeah, um, I just want to say, um, uh, generally, um, I don't want to make this more verbose, but I, I generally, I, I like the comments and changes that Steve put in there. So I, I, I just, from what I have read, I don't have no issue with anything that's in there and would be in favor of just approving everything. That's how I feel anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have some several several issues here that I'll need to bring up when it's my turn. But... Okay, let me go to Janet and then Dan. I would like to second the motion. I don't know why. I mean, we've talked about this introduction and both Nexus statements over and over. We actually agreed on it. All this information that's been added could be sent to Steve by Steve Roof to, you know, whoever's handling this next. Or it could be in a summary doc, introductory document introducing the town council. But are we going to start arguing about deleting this piece about farmland and forests and, you know, A or B or, you know, what percentage? And I, I just feel like we're going to never end. We just we've been here before. Let's just, you know, let's just move on. You know, Scott Cation had great comments. We didn't adopt, you know, most of them. Um, but, you know, invite people to participate in the process. Steve Roof has come to every one of our meetings, and I wish he had brought this up a month or two ago when we were talking about this. Yeah. I think we always did say, not that we had left time for it, but that we would circle back to this beginning section at the end. Uh, but I remember that. I thought we were, I thought it was, I thought we were done. And, you know, no one's in love with it, but no one's, yeah. everybody seems okay. accepting it. All right, Dan. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Jack. I um, I think that these are really good um, revisions, especially the very first paragraph that was added. It's extremely important. Um, and so I, I'm open to um, discussing these revisions, um, keeping many of them. I, I think I kind of agree uh, the DOER might be a little late in the game for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think these are really important revisions. All right, Martha. Are there any? Um, yes. Uh, we, let, uh, we, let's let's start with the premise. Let's start with the premise that we keep everything from Steve, uh, and then what what what? Could what we vote these on comments? No, no. We I, haven't voted yet. Can we uh, vote on the motion. Thanks first. Okay. If you look down at his needs, um, Chris, you eliminated two statements. Uh, that were general in here. And then you put in Steve's that says the need to meet legal greenhouse gas reduction commitments. It was not a law. It was an adopted goal. I checked that with our town council president just to make sure. So that is an incorrect statement. It needs to be removed. Well, the, the, state, the state has legal commitments. Excuse me, Martha, I did not make these um, deletions. These were things that were uh, recommended by Steve Roof. I made the yes. recommendations that he 
yeah. suggested and i don't want to be um Excuse you me, know no, I, did, yeah, I don't was, want anyone to say that i made these deletions i made them only because they were comments that i received just as i made changes when i received comments from you and from others so i don't want to have my work here mischaracterized thank you, you. Excuse me. sorry sorry yeah but but steve is not a member of our committee uh, but so the original statement was the need for non-carbon forms of energy generation and storage to meet our action goals and then the need to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the people of the town of Amherst and the region. And so we need to remove the one that says, you know, implies that our, that the town of Amherst made a legal commitment to this because they didn't. That's not a law. And um, then the idea of the next one, the need to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the people of Amherst by reducing the health impacts caused by pollution from combustion. You do that by uh, <laughs> reducing the driving of gasoline and diesel powered vehicles by conversion of buildings to heat pumps and so on. That's got that's not uh, something relevant to solar. <laughs> uh, And so, and so I would like to suggest that those two be removed and the original ones put back in. Okay, and otherwise you could live with what Steve has. Uh, um... yeah, and then otherwise, the only other thing is in the far section. Um, Steve recommended taking out a sentence that says, recent research clearly shows that global climate goals cannot be achieved without significantly increasing the amount of carbon sequestration. And I had previously sent a couple of research articles to the uh, committee, you know, some months ago, but there really is a lot of research uh, to the UN and the international panel and, and so on that we are not um, succeeding in um, Reaching, reaching our goals of sequestration. And maybe, Stephanie, if you could just show that plot from the yeah, state. I'm sorry, Martha, I'm trying to follow where you are, but you were breaking up, so I couldn't oh. hear the language. So yes. could you tell me where? <laughs> yes, I was wondering if you could then show that, that plot from the um, state plan that shows that we need, uh, the state climate goals for 2050 show that we need 15% uh, uh, of our quote net zero needs to be made up from carbon sequestration and our present level is at about five percent um i'm sorry so are you asking me to leave this document find another document and display oh, that no. document? okay never never <laughs> mind. Just i'm just I i'm just thinking time wise i mean i hear you but i'm just okay. not sure that's yeah. sufficient that i okay. sent you this morning but never mind but anyway i just request <laughs> that statement be put back in that says recent research clearly shows that global climate goals cannot be achieved without significantly increasing the amount of carbon sequestration. Um, I think we need to go line by line because there's quite a few substantial changes and deletions. Can I, well, I want to suggest because everyone's jumping around. So I think it really just makes sense to start and just go through these. I mean, we started to do that and I think it's just going to make a lot more sense to do that now. Um, it sounds like this part was not particularly controversial. I mean, this really is just stating what's in the cart. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I would say start there and just, Martha, you pulled out a few things um, right. specifically. So let's just. Yep, and let's so, do this. Yes. Okay, so I'll start with um, the, this bylaw aims to balance multiple needs. So the first sentence was, um, was recommended to be removed by Steve Roof, the need for non-carbon forms of energy generation and storage to meet climate action goals. And so, I recommend that that be put back in. Martha wants to put it back in. Yeah, why don't we go, I'm in favor of that, um, unless yeah. anybody else says anything, let's keep going, yep. The need to meet legal greenhouse gas emissions reduction commitments formally adopted by the Commonwealth of Mass and the town of Amherst. That's the one that I object to because it's not a legal by law, it's, it's a commitment and a goal. And I think that the, having the other one 
of saying that, that you know, of having put in the goals uh, here in the, in the original part and then saying that we need to, uh, uh, you know, go to our non-carbon forms of energy to meet climate goals is sufficient. So I... All right, I would just point out, I, I would, I mean, I'm fine with taking out the word legal at the same time. It is a legal commitment by the Commonwealth, not by the town. So we might parse that out and say uh, legal uh, greenhouse gas commitments by the Commonwealth and the goals and the and the uh, commitment goals of the town. Didn't we, oh. just, say that, didn't we just say that in well, the new language? Well, it, it, it is redundant that way. It, it, it um, uh, that's what it spells out at the beginning. This is more about balancing these various needs. Uh, yeah. So maybe it's worth repeating. I don't know. Why don't you just say the need to reduce carbon emissions and then just move on? We all I mean, you know, it's like, I don't know. Yeah. It, just, it seems like we're beating. Well, maybe the just reduce the carbon emissions as committed by the town and by the Commonwealth and the town. Yeah, yes, that was the original one. The need, the need for non-carbon forms of of we don't need to reduce carbon. We all know that and just move on. Um, I, I don't know why we're here, but anyway, um, I think the need to promote health, safety, and welfare for the people of the town of Amherst and the region, period, because we all know health, safety, and welfare is a very broad category. And so if we start adding, you know, of course we have to reduce health impacts, but we also have to support the local economy, you know, um, produce, you know, protect our farmland and our forests. And we're just going to keep on going in a circle on that. I, okay. I just, I'm good with scratching that um, added yeah. clause. So I would scratch um, Jack. Yeah, I just want to say I'm, I'm in agreement with Martha for these first three bullets, you know, just keep them as they were. It's... Yep. Okay. All right. Um, the need to preserve the natural environment, protect resources of carbon sequestration and storage, and minimize impacts on scenic, natural, and cultural resources and on residential neighborhoods. I, I don't see that, any problems threw, with that. Yeah, I threw that in just for our um, Dover issues in terms of setbacks. So. Okay. Okay, the need to preserve prime farmland and agricultural soils to provide for local food production, support farm to table dining, farmers markets. I think this is actually something that Janet had, but maybe not. Anyway, it seems fine to me. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. seem controversial. The need to implement the goals of the state's climate action plans and the resilient lands initiative initiatives goal of no net loss of forests and farmland. Um, and the, the other things are just uh, text. Okay, the need for farmland and agricultural soils to produce healthy food, food products, support farm to table dining, farmers markets. I think Steve was saying to take that out because it's redundant, but it I can leave. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. And okay, so we'll leave that out. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, the need to protect all natural resources in town, including forests, forest resources that support the local economy. Okay, then the next one is take out the need to implement the goals of the state's climate action plans and resilient lands initiative. I think that's redundant yeah. also. Do yeah. people agree with that? Okay. I, um, I don't, wait. I, don't, a, I, think I think we already a, said that before, didn't we? We haven't talked about protecting natural working lands and no net loss. No, we just did. Where? It's, it should be in once rather than twice. Is that the idea? Right yeah. here. Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Okay. Yes, yes, that one up there. Up there, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, the need to implement the 2021 climate action plan adaptation, climate action adaptation and resilience plans goals of reaching emission reduction commitments in ways that support equity, climate justice, economic prosperity, and community resilience, as well as streamlining <clears throat> solar project permitting. Encouraging responsible siting, et cetera. So is yeah. that all okay? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then this is the one that people have trouble with. This article strives to encourage putting these things on parcels A and B. I also have trouble with that because I don't really know enough about the state's designation of these parcels. So I would be perfectly happy to take that out if everybody agrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would maybe just revert to the original language. Okay, revert to original language. All right, um, 
this article balances the critical goal of increased solar energy. I think that's also redundant, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. All right. And then um, this article strives to encourage. So what do people think about that? That social equity thing. I, I really don't think we made an attempt to do this, but if other people think we did, then we could leave it in. Um, I, think, I think it was an aspiration, but we didn't yeah, actually do it. Yeah, I think he's right. I don't think we talked about low income at all here at no. any point in the document, except for this line right here. I actually, I'm not sure I quite agree because a lot of, um, you know, protecting the farmland and the forest land, you know, I think we're a really unique community in not only having a lot of local food production and jobs, we also have like the fresh markets, you know, making sure that local food goes to their survival center and the, the fresh markets. And then the fact that we have all these conservation lands and forest lands means that everybody has access to it. And, you know, every neighborhood in Amherst, you can walk out of, no matter if it's a low income apartment complex or not, you can just walk into, you know, scenic roads, conservation lands. It's for everybody. It's not just kept for, you know, more exclusive neighborhoods. And so I've always felt like, we're really good at sharing our resources and, and beauty and, you know, forests and the ability, you know, you don't have to go on vacation yeah. when you live in Amherst because you can just walk into a forest or down farm road and stuff like that. So I think that, you know, we share like, you know, a lot of, a lot of towns are kind of enclaves and we're not an enclave and we, ha everybody has access to the things we do all do. All right. I, I think nobody would disagree with that. I'm not sure whether this, whether we really, this needs to be here or maybe it doesn't hurt, but Jack. Yeah. The, uh, I think the last bullet covers the spirit of that, of this particular paragraph. So I think it's redundant for the most part. And. Well, I, I would leave it in and, you know, maybe we can, they can debate it later, but I, I think as a community, we really try to share our resources, to have local food, get it to the farm, you know, survival center, get it to the farmer's market. We have, a whole myriad of ways of getting local food to low-income people in our community. Well, we talk yeah. about local food and the importance of that earlier. I'm not sure if we need it, 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 that sort of. Well, it's part of equity and justice. You know, it's it's making sure that the resources in our community are available for everybody. And I think we I think we've done that. You know, a lot of places like you know you solar you cite unpleasant projects in a poor community, and here we're saying. You know, it can be X, Y, and Z, not just putting it into like a low income area. Yeah. And I know that I has always been in my head yeah. as I've been working on this, frankly. I would say that I've seen um, when I think about low income, um, there are, at least when it relates to solar, very specific ways to support low income communities when it comes to solar. And we did not address any of those here. So, for example, community solar in the state of Massachusetts. Under the SMART program, there's a carve out if you're providing power to LMI communities, um, and you know New York has these too. We didn't. I mean, I hear I hear you, Janet. I just as it regard as it relates to solar, I haven't seen anything. Listen, I, I don't. We, we can leave it in as if we want to make our. If, you know, for me, I don't really think it's real, but um, uh, but you know, just because when 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 I go to events or speakers that talk about low income and solar. None of the none of the um, ideas that are included have been incorporated in these bylaws. But I'm not going to okay. You know, yeah. Move on. Anybody feels other than um, Jen? Anybody feel strongly for keeping it in or putting it back in? Me. Also, I just want to say the farmers who actually work the land are usually kind of low income. <laughs> it's not like a big money field. So I, I think I don't know. I just think, you know. I think we're we're pushing a little bit on on this equity that we really didn't address i would sort of maybe put it up if you wanted to add that to, to an earlier part where it said the need to prefer prime farmland to support farm to table and support the local economy and equity commitments of the of this yeah, of the town. access to food by low-income people yeah okay uh and that might suffice if we add that to that earlier bullet uh, and support the local economy and access to low food, uh, local food by uh, by our low income communities. Something along those lines. Okay, um, that's it, right, uh, Chris? For this section, 
uh, that uh, what we needed to look at here. The rest, I think we've looked. Are there major edits? edits? Pretty much, we've looked at things pretty much. Um, Steve Roof at had a. Statement? Okay, the nexus statement. Oh. Do we need a yeah. nexus statement really be, uh, in terms of forest because we're not really controlling yeah. forest that much anymore? You know, know. Um, the the um, town council, town attorney said we need nexus statements. Those would be excellent. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I thought but, our nexus statement was fine. Um, and I, I find it astounding that anyone doesn't think we need to increase carbon sequestration because you can just go to policy, UN policies talking about, you know, I mean, it's not just ending deforestation, it's reforestation, that it's like an international goal. And um, it's in the state plan, it's in the, you know, it's in the town, it's, you know, it's just, it seems remarkable to me that. I think oh, his point mentioned. was, may he I also, just, I talked ahead. to him at length about this. And I think his point was that Massachusetts doesn't have the capacity to increase carbon sequestration because of the climate that we have and the landscape that we have. Other places in the world do have that opportunity. And he didn't think that that statement was appropriate for Massachusetts. So that's why, are we, why, why are he suggested taking about it that? That's why are we talking about that? I strongly disagree with that with Steve on this point. I mean, yes, why are we doing this about solar? Well, let's not let's not uh, talk about Steve's but, comment. Let's just decide ourselves yes. whether okay. we want to so, have this in our nexus statement or not. On the on the basis of the Massachusetts uh, Climate Action Plan for 2050, that clearly states that to reach net zero. They are predicting that we need 15% of um, sequestration and that we're not there yet. We need more. When Jonathan Thompson came and spoke to us about forests, um, he clearly stated that in the wintertime, our conifers uh, do continue with their carbon sequestration. Steve's comment is, oh, well, because Massachusetts has seasons and, you know, no leaves in the winter, we don't, we aren't contributing. And that's not true based on um, Jonathan Thompson's statements. It's also not true in the articles that Muma has written. It's not true in the um, forest, uh, I don't quite have the right title, but there's an article on forest lands that was put out by the UMass uh, Climate Extension that talks about that. It was talked about in our um, UMass Solar Forum, this was mentioned. So there's lots of evidence. I've also read very recently that the Amazon may be past the tipping point in terms of fires and destruction so that we cannot count on our tropical forests as um, being you know, the sole survivor. So I would very strongly disagree with Steve. I mean, he's entitled to his opinion, but he's not... Uh, the only expert in Massachusetts. And so I um, request that the statement, recent research uh, clearly shows that global climate, global climate goals cannot be achieved without significantly increasing the amount of carbon sequestration uh, be reinserted. Um, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I mean, I it is it is true, and uh, and I'm good with you know putting it back in. But what, what again disturbs me is that you know it's not just forests; it's it's all undeveloped um, natural lands yeah. serve this yeah. purpose. And I just feel like this sequestration thing has been a little bit uh, used as a as a as a uh, uh, some sort of lance or whatever. It, it's been used in the wrong in the wrong spirit in my mind <laughs> because yeah. really we just have to be careful about development in general and and yeah. what we're removing but yeah. uh yeah i i it's okay could we put yeah. in something about and wetlands or something in here because i mean yes i agree that the wetlands are the most important often yeah. so of course forests are what are kind of protecting the wetlands you know the wetlands are in the middle yeah. I mean, I think there's also, I mean, I would also argue we should put in the point that solar, uh, a, a, a well-developed solar field can also, you know, isn't devoid of carbon sequestration, it's just diminished carbon sequestration. 
Yeah. But anyway, just that statement, though, that that we had in there before was general. It wasn't, you know, specifically saying yeah, it's also very it's a global statement. It's not yes. really um, uh, it doesn't necessarily it doesn't get to Massachusetts per se. Dan yeah. Has his hand up. I don't know if he. Um, took oh, sake, sorry. Where's Dan? <laughs> I, I took it down because it's irrelevant now. So. Okay, I see no harm in including it. I mean, it's a, it is a statement. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree. I think it um, is a bit out of place because it's on, it gets for the whole globe, um, and its relevance specifically to the town of Amherst isn't well quite, uh, the context there. Um, uh, can and just add? Can I jump in? I'm sorry, but just add the word. Um, global in front of carbon sequestration. So its recent research clearly shows that global climate goals cannot be achieved without significantly increasing the amount of global carbon sequestration. I think that's, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, just Steve was the one that added the global, <laughs> but then that, okay, then then. I think, um, I think we're just going down a rabbit hole. Like the yeah. whole statements, the whole purpose of these statements were to support um, you know, different to address the Dover Amendment and the SJC's concerns that we have to give reasons for our regulations. And this is a nexus statement on forest lands. I would be happily throwing in wetlands because we have the wettest forest I've ever walked in. But I think we're just like, I don't know what the purpose of these comments are by Steve Roof. Like I could say, well, Jonathan Thompson said the, you know, Massachusetts forests are still increasing sequestration because they're young. And I mean, but it's just like, I, you know, this isn't a scientific debating thing. It's just these are sentences that are clearly supportable and we're just talking to the SJC. We might even have bad reasons, but these are the reasons we gave. And that's what the court is asking us to do. So I think, you know, I feel like I'm in this weird debate, but we we this whole introduction and these nexus statements serve a purpose. We agreed on them. And now we're sitting here at, you know, our. Okay, let's just continue to go through. We're almost at the end. Um, okay. And I think we're making so good we'll progress. Yeah, we're going to leave that in and add global before carbon, second carbon, I guess. You know, we're, I mean, we're globally, globally, we're all attached. I, I don't know. <laughs> all right, what are we doing? Um, New England has experienced river flooding, hillside forests help retain water. Forest buffers also act as natural filters. This was something that Scott Cashin added, but his wording was a little bit weird. So I, I, reworded it to say forest buffers also act as natural filters, increasing fil infiltration of water into soil and slowing and minimizing sheet flow of water. So that's not a statement that anyone needs to argue about, I don't think. Um, no, I, th I thought forest, take, <laughs> forest reduces the infiltration of water because they transpire a lot of the water. Yes, that's, yeah. I was Increases say infiltration of water, doesn't it? Forests? No, seems like Not, a solar. It doesn't solar increase rate. runoff. It, it, no. it takes it up the water in. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, That's I would not make any uh, change. I'd leave it as it was. I mean, it actually reduces think... infiltration. It compared, to, compared to barren land, yeah. It, there's transfer in a vast amount of transpiration, which uh, for force, it's uh, so that's that's an error. What did Dan say? Forests reduce infiltration uh, because of evapotranspiration. So it should right, be so returned to what um, returned to what Scott Cashin had initially. That's what you're saying, right? I didn't know. So what leave he... the word leave the word slowing. Take out the word increasing. Right. Yes. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's next? Anything? Um, Next is statement for farmland. Okay. Um, so there were comments here about, you know, just making sure that you have the um, references correct. So Massachusetts soil maps, which are, and I checked with our GIS guy, and he says they're digital soils maps created by the Natural Resources Conservation Service, U.S. Department of Agriculture, which can be found at that link. Um, and then someone added, Amherst is fortunate to host over 2180 acres of farmland permanently protected. I think that was something that Steve Roof added. 
-hmm. And then let's see, access to locally grown food is important for the health, safety, and welfare of our residents. Much of Amherst local farmland is devoted to raising vegetables and other food crops for humans and animals. That was something that Steve Roof mentioned because he thinks that um, a lot of what's grown in Amherst is hay, I guess, for horses and oh. cows, et cetera. Um, and then let's see. Uh, Amherst boasts a thriving farmer's market, subscription services for weekly produce. The local university and colleges buy food from local farms. I think Janet put that in. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, um, let's see, the Town of Amherst schools regarding combating climate change as outlined in the Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan dated June 2021. So that's all good. Indeed. Okay, uh, Janet. Uh, yeah, I just I don't like to, this being uh, specific about the number of acres there because that's just going to change. Can we just say Amherst is fortunate to host oh, uh, to significant farmland, significant yeah. farmland permanently protected? Yeah, yes, yes that's good. Right, let's do that. OK, thanks, Jack. Yeah. OK, is that a wrap? <laughs> is that the end of it? Mm -hmm. It is now. <laughs> so, it is. Yeah, it, it is. was the end of the nexus. We, we got through it all. You were you were getting to definitions, and I didn't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't. Well, there were other changes suggested by Janet and also Scott Cashin, but I don't know if we need to go through those. Those in, didn't seem particularly controversial to me. In definitions, um, submittal requirements, and I guess definitions. That was one thing. Someone suggested having a more robust definition of prime farmland. So, I made it more robust. It's very wordy, but okay, if that's important, that's fine. Um, submittal requirements, there were a lot of things added to submittal requirements. You want me to share that again then? I don't know if it's worth it going over it because we didn't, yeah. I don't think we spent a lot of time on submittal requirements in the first place. So it's really more of a you know, zoning board and planning board thing. I th I would like to talk about permitting path and where do we go next? Yeah, let's do that. And uh, to the extent that um, we can cover that fairly quickly and then get some public comments uh, where, where we can finish up today. Uh, go okay. ahead, Martha. Yeah, do we need to make a formal vote that we approve of this draft of the uh, bylaw? I yes. mean, this is going to go to a town council, so... Um, Shouldn't we have a formal vote? Yep, uh, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to make a motion to such? <laughs> I, I move <laughs> that we approve the draft solar bylaw as discussed and amended in our meeting on November 9th, 2023. <laughs> Is there a second? No. <laughs> Just Did you say no? Did you say no, Janet? It was a joke. It was a joke. <laughs> or, Martha, I second your motion. All right, go ahead. <laughs> like a moment of levity. You didn't. I know. Okay. Oh like I In no particular order, um, Hannah? Yes. Gregor? Yes. McGowan? Yes. Corcoran? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Agliarulo? Yes. All right. All right. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Mazel tov, everybody, as they say. Oh, do we need public <laughs> comment, Blaine? A very We're going to have public comment, but first, um, uh, well, there, let me ask are. for people yeah. if, if we could have 15 more minutes of people's time today. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, maybe in, in deference to the public, maybe we should... Uh, look for public comments first, and then we'll look at the schedule. Yeah, uh, I think would would be a better protocol. So, um, let me ask if there's we we have uh, uh, five attendees. Um, so, if anybody would like to offer any thoughts or comments, um, please raise your hand digitally. Um, okay, Scott Stephanie, Passion, can, you can okay. go ahead and unmute. Yeah, and thank you for all your input. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to clarify that laundry list of bullet items I added at the end, that was intended just to 
be you know helpful. Um, I in reviewing the bylaw, there were some sections that had quite a bit of specificity and others that didn't. So I I wasn't sure sort of what path um, the committee was going down is in that regard. Um, I will say that especially with regard to mitigation, um, it's really important to be as specific as possible. Um, this you know document is, I assume intended to sort of be a standalone thing that is going to exist for you know quite some time. And um, you know what what you want to avoid is you know a decade from now um, somebody saying, "Gee, this this isn't what we really intended," or "We don't know what the intent was here." And so, to the degree that you can be as specific as possible, it's beneficial. But those bullets at the end don't need to go before the town council is something that I wanted to add. It was really just, you know, I just kind of slapped them in there as things to look at. And if you found a bullet that was useful to add, so be it. And if not, you can just delete those. So that's all. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. And and, and um, I do recall you came to town recently, or maybe not so recently, and, and uh, really encourage you to stay involved in all this uh, with your expertise. Okay, anybody else wish to offer any thoughts? All right, good. Um, okay, great. So, um, Stephanie, maybe we can share the document that was in the packet with regard to the next steps. Can can we first go back to the yep. document that is an excerpt from the category, the use table um, okay. in the mm -hmm. zoning bylaw because it has specific requirements for permitting of these things. And I wanted to make sure that everybody agreed with my recommendation. Um, I'm That's sorry, the, can you read the title of that? Um, it's page 37. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah, the spreadsheet. Is it this? Uh, sorry, yeah, I know. I'm just, I've got things saved here as PDF. So it's the section 3.3 .3 use classification. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that's it. Yep. Just give me a second. I also need to make it bigger. While we're waiting, Janet, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, I, I think we could, um, we don't really need to vote on the next step in terms of what happens to the bylaw because it says in the charge, develop a solar bylaw that will be transmitted to the town council and the planning board for review. And so I think that, you know, that's our next step. And I'm hoping, you know, and I, I, I think it's admirable to send it to town staff for their comments, um, you know, but I don't, when I saw that step about the comments, you know, like town staff making comments and then it going back for more ads and changes, I think that I think we did our work. We should send it to the town council and the planning board, let them figure out what they want to do with it next and, you know, not get into some a long discussion. I mean, I just think, you know, here's it's just a clean statement. And I don't I, I don't not want to hear what town staff thinks about it, but I don't think it should be part of our process. Or it should have happened like a month ago <laughs> or two months ago. And so I, I just, you know, we can't approve a bylaw and then have ads and changes made it and say it's still our bylaw. So oh, I'm ready to move on, you know, and get yeah. just give it to the town council and, you know. Well, let's get to that in a moment after we cover what Chris wanted to cover. Um, so Stephanie, Steph I don't think we had the right document shared we're looking at a zoom a big zoom uh screen it was making me nervous <laughs> sorry i have it i just didn't have the right screen clicked hold on okay now do you see yeah exactly yeah okay so can you scroll down to page 37 this is quite a document by the way <laughs> I didn't know how to extract page 37 from this document, so I'm sorry about that. I thought I had done that at one point. I thought so, so too. Yeah, Yeah, I'll I thought see. so too, but um, go, go up. Oh, that's 36, I'm sorry, keep, okay, go on. So where, keep going? Where or? is it? It's not showing up. It was in red, if I recall. Uh, Very strange. 
Wait, wait, where? Wait, the I think one that you had given. I I took this from what was sent to me, so I'm not I sure. I think it was. Just, I think we went over it because I saw something about TV antennas. Isn't that the energy facilities thing? Well, it's three point three three point three four zero point four. So maybe keep going. Maybe it's not page thirty-seven. Maybe it's some other thing. Yeah, it's for hits here, right? Keep going. Yeah. Utility uses, isn't that it? Here it is. It's on 44. Okay, there it is. All right, 44. Okay, yeah. sorry. All right, so what I'm saying here is that um, these things should be allowed in all zoning districts, but only by special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And that is so far the way we've been approving mm -hmm. um, these things. Now, you may not want to vote on the battery energy storage system since you didn't review that. You may only want to vote on the large-scale ground-mounted solar installation, but here is what my recommendation would be for a permitting path for the, for these types of installations. And I think we did discuss this at a previous meeting and there was, I think we thought to just keep it as a special permit throughout. Mm -hmm. So that's okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. Do you need to take a vote on that? Need to vote on that. It would can, be can we blow that up a little bit, or I can do it on my end, I guess. No. Yeah, I don't know how to yeah. blow it up without losing. You're going to end up losing some rows at the end. But that's okay. So Anyways, above, so above, like you know, you see these little gray and white columns. Is are the different zoning districts like? Yeah, residential yeah, yeah. RO. Okay. yeah so that's the different zoning districts some of them are go ahead i was just going to say it's special permit all the way across mm -hmm. okay which yeah okay i feel safe doing it that way mm -hmm. i don't see any reason for doing it another way. Initially, I had thought maybe we should make it by site plan review in one or two of these districts, but I, I don't really think that's appropriate. I think leave it all with the Zoning Board of Appeals. They seem to be doing a good job so far. And now that they have a solar bylaw, or now that they will have a solar bylaw to guide them, they'll do an even better job. <laughs> okay, so maybe you don't need to take a vote on this unless you feel like it. I think we should vote on it because I think you know it gives us it. So I make I make a motion to approve site plan review for all special permit special permit. Special, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> special permit for all large scale ground mounted solar installations and BESS or battery energy storage storage systems. All right. Oh. Before we go for a second, let me hear from Jack. Oh, I was just going to say I second that. There you go. Well, with a raised hand. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hold on. I, I have a question about my motion. When we say best, we're not talking about battery systems that are going on houses with arrays. Is that, is there a, I don't want to. No. Okay. Unless you're uh, come on in. I'll 250 deliver. kilowatts in your backyard on the ground. Okay, so we need a vote, and I'm going to ask the people um, unmute themselves and get on camera. Can Can I have a? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So, um, okay, so in no particular order, McGowan. Yes. Gregor. Yes. Corcoran. Yes. Demsek. Yes. Tanner. Yes. And Pagliarulo. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Hi, sorry about that. All right, what did you, did you just no, we have? Had a, it passed, you're good to go, Chris. Passed, okay. <laughs> good, thank you. And now we can not talk about, we don't have to talk about next steps and approval process. I can make recommendations on, you know, as a planning director, but you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. Yes, I, I do have a couple of questions about the next steps in the approval process. So I think it would be helpful if we could display it and go through it. Yep. Since we've never seen it until this week. 
I think you did see it for your last meeting in a different form. I believe it was sent to you in your last meeting. But um, okay. so, so the idea here is that what we have voted on today is in a not it's not ready to be approved by town council in the current form that it's in. It doesn't have any section um, numbering and some of the formatting is off and it just needs to be kind of put together in a format that we can hand it to town council, then they can refer it to the planning board and the CRC for public hearings. So my proposal is to um, take the document and have staff review it, and that includes the building commissioner and senior planner, Nate Malloy, and Stephanie Ciccarello, who hasn't really had an opportunity to make many comments here, and Aaron Jock, who's the wetlands administrator, and Chris Bascom, the fire prevention officer. And they should review it and make sure that it fits within the um, requirements of their jurisdiction. And then um, Stephanie and I would take those comments and insert those into the document and um, into a report to town council. And then um, we would bring it to KP Law, uh, the document that we um, finalize, that Stephanie and I finalize, and send it to KP Law for its comments because we know that there are issues related to Chapter 40A, Section 3, having to do with um, how much cities and towns can regulate um, solar arrays. And then on December 4th, we will present this to town council and we'll say to them, we could say to them, here's the document that the solar bylaw working group voted on and agreed to. Here's the document that we have um, refined into a format that can be adopted by town council. Um, and then the town council will receive that. Now there could be another step, which would be to refer it to the community resource committee for um, their um, refinement, or we could leave out that step. Um, and then it would be taken by town council and referred to the planning board and the CRC for public hearing. What I don't want to happen is that some um, un unrefined and kind of raw document is given to town council for adoption because I think that's gonna cause confusion. So that's why I put in these other steps because they're gonna say, well, has the building commissioner reviewed this? Has the wetlands administrator reviewed this? What does the fire department think of this? And what does town council think of this? So going through these extra steps, I think is really important. And um, so this would be my recommendation about how this gets transmitted. I can transmit the document that you all voted on today, along with a refined version of it. Um, that would be staff's recommendation, having heard from these other entities. I mean, another Maybe. option would be to uh, any, any uh, changes based on these reviews by these uh, staff people are included as track changes uh, so that um, there's uh, remains a a uh, preservation of what what our committee voted on to approve versus changes that have occurred um, subsequently. That's why I was saying to give town council the document that you yeah. approved today, and then also give them the document that we will refine. But if you think that the document that we will refine should be in track changes, that would be fine. Um, I, either way, I think is fine with me. I would just, uh, I would agree with you, Chris. I would, uh, assuming you, what you, when you say give to the town council what we passed today, I would at least take that through your, your first edits to polish it up and format it um, and make it look like um, a, a, a bylaw that's kind of ready to pass, but, um, but uh, it's going to be out for public, for some of these, not public, but uh, some of these staff comments. So um, yeah, not the raw draft that we have, but polished up with your formatting and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, um, so any thoughts on that, um, uh, Martha and then Janet? 
Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, of course, I think that's an excellent idea. I mean, you've been working so hard on on all this and trying to keep up with everything that we've changed and so on that I think that it's a, you know, an excellent idea to then take some time to get it, you know, polished and, you know, consulted and see if we, you know, missed some important detail that the uh, building commissioner or the fire department knows and so on. But I would like to request then that when you get uh, what looks like a formal final version, that before it actually literally gets submitted to the town council, that uh, it is sent to the members of the solar bylaw working group so that we have a time to read it and if we wish, uh, submit any written comments? I, I, If you don't mind, I think it would be helpful if that occurred later on. I'll tell you why. We're on a very tight timeline. The yeah. town council currently has four meetings left in the year. Um, we're proposing to give this to them on December 4th. Um, we're not proposing to have any further work on this until 2024. And I think if we were to have to come up with the final document and then send it back to the Solar by the Working Group for final comments and then send it back to town council, that's probably not um, a very efficient way of doing it. Another way of doing it would be for, um, when and when this does go to CRC, for members of the Solar Bottle Working Group to submit comments at that time. That's my, that's my recommendation. Couldn't we at least have the opportunity to see it? I yes. Don't I'm I think just, you can have the opportunity to see at least it. be, yep. a, you know, formally sent a, a copy to say this is, you know, our, you know, final version. And then if we should see, you know, at least we then we have the opportunity so that if we saw something that somehow, you know, somebody said, oops, that really wasn't our intention or something that at least would have the opportunity. I mean, I think we've worked for 18 months on this, although Chris, you've actually been the one to do most of the work and trying to take everything that we've discussed up, down and sideways and <laughs> get it into something that looks like a coherent draft. I, I still would like to the opportunity to at least see it in its final form. I think that's reasonable, yep. Yeah. Is, that okay? Is that okay with people? No. Yeah. I, I have to say in the strongest terms, this is the, you know, I think it's a great idea for Chris to do the formatting and numbering and the refinement. So it's in a good shape, you know, cause there's definitely some stuff, you know, strange lettering and numbering, but I don't want more comments made and changes made by other staff members and have that come out as solar bylaw working group stuff. And I, you know, I just, and I don't want to come back here and start arguing over changes is that this is the draft that we You're came You're breaking up. up at least for me. Oh, so this oh, is no, the- I, I hear her, Dwayne, she's good. So this is the draft that we approved of. If edits are put on by different staff members, it's no longer our draft. Um, I'm, I think we should, you know, I think we should basically send this draft with, you know, with the formatting, and the numbering edits and refinement refinement sent to town council, they're going to, you know, CRC is going to want to hear what the, you know, other staff want to do, let them handle the changes. But if we start having red line change saying, oh, this is by Chris, and this is by so-and-so, and this is by so-and-so, but this is the language, it's going to be a mess to send that to the town council. Um, I just, I don't, and it's not going to be what we, what we agreed on. And so, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Um, because I hear you, Janet, and I actually agree with you. Um, my understanding, and Chris, not to sort of mess with your process, but my understanding was that we would send the version that the solar bylaw working group is doing, refine that, send it to the council, and then in a parallel path, staff would have yes. their comments, and our comments would then get submitted through the other like planning and CRC review processes. So I I have to agree with Janet. Um and I'm sorry I I'm not not to ever go against you, Chris, or 
contradict or anything, but I, but I do think we had discussed that. And I think it just makes a lot more sense because I do agree that it wouldn't be the product of this, what this group just voted on. So I agree, but I, you know, it's just a lot to think about. And I know we're trying to balance how staff weighs in as well, but I, I think it would make more sense for staff comments to go through the council process. Let me let me just ask, I mean, to Chris's point that, you know, if I was a town councilor and I received this, I guess the first comment would be, has the has the uh, wetlands person looked at this? Has the fire person looked at this? Uh, and so and, and and so I think so I'm sort of grappling with how to be most efficient to the and, and helpful to the town council. Uh, and so I, I, I for myself, I have no problems giving them the raw, not the raw, but the polished version of exactly what we agreed to today. But would there be in that transmission, would there be a statement that, oh, this to the town council, that this is now currently under review by staff and you'll be getting a an, a, a separate a, a separate copy of a, a revised version that includes staff um, uh, thoughts and comments? Yeah, that'd be uh, my my approach to this is changing as you're speaking. I think um, it is correct to give town council the document that um, the solar bylaw working group worked on today. And I will just do that, give them that document in its clean form. And then um, I will send town council a memo with my recommendations about what happens to it now. What I don't want to happen to it is that town council takes the document that they receive from the solar bylaw working group and immediately refers it to the planning board and the, and the community resources committee for public hearings, because I don't think it's in a form that would be um, appropriate to send uh, to those two groups for public hearings. It needs more work. Um, and so anyway, that's I'm agreeing with you that I will send them the document that you voted on today. I might um, spend some time, uh, you know, putting some numbers and you know, page, what do you call it, paragraph numbers and things like that in it, but I'll, I'll send them what you have come forth with today. And then I will accompany that with a memo making suggestions about what happens to it after that. All right, super. All right, any other, um, and thank you, Chris and Stephanie for working your magic on, on that end and the best process through through town hall. Um, Martha? Uh, yeah, so on that, I mean, realistically, I mean, we've just had election, the town council is going to be changing. They're really not going to do anything serious with this document until well into uh, January or even February, I would say, because, you know, they're going to have to get reorganized, re reorganize each of their committees, et cetera, et cetera, after the first of the year and so on. So I think there would be you know, ample time for you to be able to then, you know, fairly <laughs> leisurely and organizedly, um, you know, proceed with what you've just uh, suggested there. Um, I would request that after you've, um, you know, polished up the document and, you know, neatened it up so it looks nice and, you know, put in what you thought we heard, to, you heard today, et cetera, et cetera, that you do then, just uh, send us all a copy so that we can uh, just read through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is, is this is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. As yeah. Long as I, 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 I do agree quickly with Janet and everyone. I, I don't think we want to open it up for more comment right now. Otherwise, we're no, taking no I just, uh, you know, just meant for, you know, just letting us see the, 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 the final, yep. you know, the thing that you're going to submit. That's all I meant there. Yeah. So, I mean, I do have comments on on something else along here, but but let's finish this first. All right, are we good then with uh, at least the immediate plan? Uh, no, I have okay. I have a question about uh, another aspect of it here. If, if you're ready. Yep. Go ahead. Yes, and that is that one of the other things here is that uh, our esteemed chair, I think, is supposed to write a report. Uh, is that is that right? Are you are you planning to to write some kind of a a report from our committee or 
Do we um, need to write a report? It's uh, just a memo and we're what? drafting it. It's just to go over the process. It's very, um, it's more just the procedural and the process. I've actually already started drafting it and it's literally, literally, there's nothing controversial or anything. It's just about, this is when we met, this is when it was voted on, this is how, okay. when we had our meetings. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's very, very process oriented. And then all of the things that you requested to be included, like we think that maybe there should be a forest protection bylaw developed that includes all development, not just solar. Those comments, Dwayne will add on his own, um, I'm doing more of the sort of process and procedure. Chris will review that and add, I'm sure, to it. Um, and then Duane will just add the stuff about the things that you all want to include for the council, maybe future action. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing that you all need to, you know, it's nothing that the group needs to be going through and vote on. It's, you know, Duane is just going to write this memo on behalf of the whole process. Yeah, well, Duane then I would like to request that our, our committee, you know, have an opportunity to, to read this uh, lovely memo that you're, you're going to write. I mean, it seems normally it's, it's pretty standard procedure in any committee that uh, at, when it finally comes to its end and, and the chair prepares a report that it is reviewed by uh, the committee members. I have so, no problem with that. Yeah, um, as long as it doesn't do that, uh, I have no problem with that. Um, as long as it's we're not talking about another meeting, we're just talking about uh, and oh, I think, you don't you don't want another <laughs> two hour uh, meeting. And as long as Stephanie, is that okay to have people review yeah. a draft as long, memo? As long as you're sending it to them for them to review, and any comments get sent back directly to you and not the entire yeah. group, because yes. essentially yes. after yes. today's meeting, you're pretty much. You're, yes. you're done really. So um, you can you can sort of do that just to weigh in on the letter ind independently with Dwayne. But you know, again, there is a timeline here that we're kind of working on and um, I'm hoping to finish what I'm working on. I'm gonna take time tomorrow to wrap up my piece. Uh-huh, yeah. Probably, it just seems probably like eagerly, <laughs> eagerly, Stephanie. Um, could I suggest that maybe we follow the process of when the planning board, um, when we have a report on zoning, Chris drafts it, she sends it to everybody, everybody writes the comments. And I don't know if we do like an approval process saying I agree or something like that, but I do think it'd be good to see, you know, cause there's things you might miss or just unbelievably offensive things. I don't know, whatever, but um, you know, so I think it'd be good cause it, you know, if it's the report of the chair, that's one thing. If it's a report of our committee, we need to read it and under and then participate in that. So well, again, this is not going to be a report. This is going to be sort of a memo of here's what we've done. Here's some of the, some of the, some of the issues that were worthy of a lot of discussion and thought we would inform the town council and others, uh, the record of these uh, issues that we discussed. Um, and um, that's sort of it. It's and, and, and there are some other deliverables that go associated with this, like the uh, mapping exercise, which will be part of the procedure and the town survey and so forth as the final transmittal of our uh, meeting the charge of the, of the committee. Um, Stephanie, thank you for kind of drafting a good portion of that. I will add sort of more from the committee on, on uh, summarizing. I'm not writing a report. I'm just summarizing uh, sort of the issues that we discussed uh, in a paragraph um, form. Uh, if um, I, I think it would make sense and I'm all for uh, sharing that memo as a draft uh, to every, with everybody uh, for some feedback, not discussion. But just feedback uh, to myself and I guess Stephanie too, or at least just to to me yeah. or Stephanie. Yeah. Um. Could we? And I was trying to think of some way to add like the input of the experts, like Scott Cation and and Kip Klans, because I don't know how that gets to the. Maybe that it's could go all, to the their names are doctor. all listed. I already wrote that part up of who came. I listed every expert that we had come to the meetings. Oh, good. I included the dates and oh, awesome. I might have said there because they're all available on the town's YouTube. So I'm pretty sure that I gave the experts and the dates that they presented. 
And then it also makes sense. Maybe the CRC and planning board should look at that too. You know, I just, I think they had some useful comments. I mean, they spent a lot of time on their comments and stuff. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. And so Dwayne, do you have an estimate of when you might get that, your, your memo done and uh, send it to us? I'm waiting for Stephanie to tell me the deadline that she wants to submit this, but uh, <laughs> that was on that was on the schedule that we were just <laughs> looking at. So I know it's in the next week or so. Yeah. Um, and so um, uh, that's, I'm not sure if it's this weekend or uh, maybe a little bit of time tomorrow. Yes. Uh, I'll try to pull that together and, and feed that into uh, Stephanie. Yeah. yeah. So we're but talking fact, fairly soon. My recommendation is always you get yourself some chocolate ice cream and then you go. To, <laughs> <laughs> my I just go with straight chocolate. I don't know about something. the ice cream. <laughs> That's going to crash my paleo diet, Martha. Come on. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can't tell you, hey, I, I, I've been going for the Halloween candy this week. Trying to get I can't, yeah, and I can't do the chocolate at night. Uh, but, <laughs> so, I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anything else other than uh, bidding everybody a fair adieu? Um, I, I would like to say thank you to everybody for working with us on this. This has been really a, a joint effort and um, appreciate all your input. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Chris. And, and let me also say thank you to the, to the uh, working group here. Um, you know, I kind of facilitated things, but really um, learned a lot. And uh, I think we all got to know each other and learned a lot and recognize this is, uh, can be hard stuff. Issues. Interesting stuff, uh, but important stuff. Um, and I think we did good for the town of Amherst. Um, and um, and let me, uh, so thank you, everybody. Great to get to know people. We'll see you around town. Thanks to um, Christine, Stephanie, and Dwayne. Thank you, guys. And, thank and you yeah, all. and a big shout out to to, uh, to Chris and Stephanie uh, for <laughs> leading leading this process. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, thank you. Guess. Thank you to Martha as my co-chair. Co you, 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 how many nights and weekends you've really spent when we start getting emails from you at, at what was definitely not normal working hours. You know, you, you both spent a, just a huge amount of time on it. So I'd like to um, I'd like to thank the, uh, to all the note takers out there that that got me up the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for all those minutes. Yeah, exactly. And as and well you. as everybody, it's, it was really a fun group to be a part of, and I learned a lot for sure. So, yeah, absolutely appreciate it. Yeah. You all did a really great job. Thank you so much for your service to the town, and it's been a pleasure to work with you all. And Dwayne, thank you for sharing in your leadership. All I don't right. think you anticipated that that would happen, but thank you. Well, you asked me a long time ago, and I was like, okay. It's like, whoa, okay. You'd be but, willing. <laughs> but it's all coming, coming to, it's almost, it's coming to an end, yeah. So, okay. All Great. right. Okay. Good thank you, everybody, so much. And, and thank you also. We have four people left as attendees, but everybody who um, joined us in the, in the public, that's really important um, input as well. And thank you for that. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.